There's certainly a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear is showing up in the bank stocks. Yes, you are going to see a lot of gyrations in the market because investors are nervous. It's another source of volatility in a highly volatile market. This is not a great backdrop to invest. You're not seeing a meltdown in the equity market. You're not really seeing broader risks of a contagion in all markets. I don't think this is going to lead to a recession. I'm still in the soft landing camp. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. What a move in the last 24 hours. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive, four-tenths of 1% on the S&P. A little bit later this morning, 8.30 Eastern <laughs> Time, CPI in America. Tom, we have to talk about this. That is the biggest reappraisal of Fed policy in a single 24 hours, I think potentially, TK, we've ever seen. We've ever seen. I think you've really got to go back to McChesney Martin, the independence of the Fed in 1952, to begin to get historical perspective here. You can go back to 98. I'm hearing that a lot, John, in the last 24 hours, people alluding not to 08, but to 98, which was a different set of cards. What people want to know this morning, 830, John, maybe. Maybe they want an inflation. <laughs> I want to know where five or six banks are. I've been watching Credit Suisse tick by tick yep. uh, this morning. And what people really want to know of all walks of life, including our sophisticated audience, should I move my money? That We're still, still there. Being asked. We're still, still there. Still being asked. So let's go through it piece by piece. Credit Suisse is lower this morning by 4.5%. We'll talk about that story a little bit later. 2.15, yep. lower the session, 2.12, just off those levels right now. First Republic absolutely battered in the last couple of days. That stock is bouncing just a little bit up by a little more than 20%. But the move into two-year yield yesterday, we have gone from north of 5% to below 4%, all in three days. Just unbelievable. Back above... 4% right now. We've got a 25 basis point move higher on our hands on a two year. And let's go through it bank by bank. <clears throat> I've got Goldman, Wells Fargo, Barclays, and others looking for a pause. Dan Iverson of PIMCO talking to the team here at Bloomberg yesterday, suggesting that maybe the Fed pauses in March. Nomura going one step further. Can I share this quote with you from the team at Nomura? In reaction to looming financial stability risks, we now expect the Fed to cut rates in 25 basis point increments in the March FOMC meeting. They go one further than that, Lisa. They said we also expect the Fed to stop QT at the meeting next week. Yeah, this was shocking to me because it raises this issue of have we really defeated inflation? Can they really reverse policy wholesale in order to prevent more distress? And this, to me, is the ultimate question of the morning. If an asteroid were facing this Earth, would the central banks just print money? At what point have we run out of ammunition to combat problems with lowering rates and buying bonds if inflation is still a problem and still something that central banks have to fight? The estimate this morning is for CPI headline year over year to come in at about 6%. Core month over month, which is the figure Tom Wall Street is very focused on, 0.4% in line with the 0.4% <clears throat> in a previous month. Uh, it's the inflation move there. What we're going to have to see is off the service sector, which Michael break down on, is do we see any in this vector, this idea of a trend, a point, a thrust of disinflation. I, I, I really can't say enough of how Mr. Powell right now needs help and assistance from the data. Talk about data dependent. This is a whole new character to data dependency we've never seen. The data's coming in a couple of hours' time. Lisa will go through the day ahead in just a moment. Your equity market set up as follows on the S&P 500. Positive by Four tenths of one percent on the S and P yields are a little bit higher by three or four basis points on a U.S. ten year three sixty ninety two. The move over the last three days has been absolutely phenomenal. Euro dollar negative two tenths of one percent here, Lisa. Euro dollar right now one zero seven eleven. All right, 8.30 a.m., what is going to be the biggest pain trade? I'm trying to get my head around that because right now this market is inflicting the most pain on the most market participants I could possibly imagine. 8.30 a.m., we do get February U.S. CPI at a time when a lot of people expect inflation to remain hot in the U.S. I'm looking at core inflation. The expectation is it will dip from 5.6 percent to 5.5 percent. This is stripping out the more volatile energy and food uh, sectors. If it remains hot, what does the Fed do? What does the market do at a time where it's moved ahead of any Fed rhetoric and just price them out of the market almost for the rest of the year in terms of rate hikes? Today, we do hear from EU finance ministers who are gathering for day two in Brussels uh, discussing the economy. This is just two days ahead of the ECB policy decision. Talk about agony, given some of the volatility we've seen. The two-year yield absolutely cratering also in sympathy with what we're seeing over in the U.S. Again, 
Does this make sense? Does a bank or a couple blanks that uh, are sort of on the peripheries, largely, not necessarily for Silicon Valley, uh, it, having issues mean that globally, Fed rates, ECB rates are all on pause and headed downward. And at 5.30 p.m., we do hear from Fed Governor Michelle Bowman, which is sort of odd because it is the quiet period, but she's talking about innovation in the banking system in Honolulu. I think we all would want to go talk about uh, monetary policy in Honolulu. Does she talk about anything with respect to financial stability risks, John? People are going to be parsing through any indication that the Fed could give that they really are possibly going to pause at a time where inflation still is the preeminent concern. Given it's the quiet period, she shouldn't be talking about anything related to monetary policy, but I guess we'll see. Priya Mesra joins us now of TD Securities. Priya, this market screams the Fed is done. Is the Fed done? I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think the Fed is committed to inflation. Inflation is still hot. I would say the consumer is still hot. Now, the market's forward-looking. I think the market is putting higher odds of a hard landing. We've been in the hard landing camp. I think this accelerates it. But I think for next week, they go another 25. I do think the bar for 50 is very high. So we're looking for a 0.5 today on uh, on core CPI. I don't think that moves the needle either. I think they go 25. They put a pretty big bazooka in place with that BTFP mm -hmm. program on Sunday. I think they're going to point to that. This was morphing. This had a risk on Sunday. I was worried right. that this is morphing from a liquidity crisis to a capital crisis. The Fed has put a pretty huge facility in place if it's accessed. And it's a big if, but I do think it's going to get accessed. I think we yeah. stem the uh, uh, the capital concerns. Uh, Priya, so you, you have been so successful on price up, yield down, on your call to load the boat on the 10-year yield. There's a rumor you may become a minority investor in the Toronto Maple Leafs. I don't want you to gain the Fed right now. I want you to talk about what you do when you are so fortunate with the crisis move. Do you tactically go to cash? Do you tactically pull in duration? What do you do after such a successful set of trading days? I mean, I think you take some chips off the table. Um, you know, the economy is still strong. This crisis is still unfolding. I took half of our position off because it was a huge move, and I don't think the Fed is done. But I think you want to be liquid. You want to also keep an eye on on a lot of stress indicators, uh, the funding markets. You know, how is this? Because capital, um, you know, the moment it becomes a capital issue, I think now we're looking at Congress. So I, I'm I'm a lot more negative if, if this morphs into a capital issue. I was, a, I was very comforted by, uh, by what the Fed did. So I think you're supposed to take some of those risks off. You're supposed to be in liquid assets so you don't have to do any fire sales. I think what got SVB in trouble was they had to go out and sell very safe assets, but still, uh, you know, uh, duration risk is real. So I think keeping some cash here, um, you're earning, you know, potentially next week, we think you're going to earn 5% on cash. It's it's attractive when, when it's highly illiquid, when you may have liquidity needs. I think you're supposed to keep risk light and then keep an eye out for opportunities. If the front end gets repriced even further, I would be tempted to go short. I think the Fed is going to be in, you know, really between a, hawk, uh, between a rock and a hard place. Inflation is going to be high and they're going to find it very hard, I think, even to pause, let alone cut. Priya, a lot of people are coming out and saying, yes, but what we're seeing is a Fed that typically raises rates until something breaks, and it seems like something is breaking. Yes, we've had bank failures, but we also are seeing volatility, the likes of which we have not seen in 40 years. I'm looking right now also, even just at the implied volatility of the Bank of America move index, surging to the highest level since 2009. At what point, just the speed of these moves in benchmark rates, is that something breaking in and of itself in market functioning? So I, I, I do look at different measures of market functioning. I think volatility is not great, but when the Fed is hiking, you know, financial conditions tighten. I think the Fed always wants, uh, you know, not a disorderly tightening in financial conditions. We're, we're getting that disorderly tightening right now. I do think they're going to watch, you know, a few more bank failures. I think the Fed stops. But I do think if they are able to put facilities in place, which the banks access, that stigma, I, I do think the Fed needs to come out and say there is no stigma, you know, the, or, or the recourse to other collateral. If you're pledging treasuries and agency MBS, that, that, that that's what that facility is there for. It's to prevent banks from having to sell. I think if they're able to sell that facility, you know, maybe that facility needs a PR department, um, <laughs> and, and we can prevent some of the, the fire sales, the, the, the capital, the realized capital losses. 
I think the issue is that we knew that there were these unrealized losses. It's when you have to realize it, go out to the market that's very skittish and try and raise capital, that's when the problems begin. So I, I agree it's very volatile, but this facility is in place. I think what the FDIC did is huge. They insured, you know, uninsured depositors are getting all their money back. I think, you know, we need some stability in the market, I agree, but I think for the Fed to actually pause or cut, it's going to send a pretty negative signal that what do they see? Do they see this facility not working? I think we're, we're all watching for that uh, Thursday evening, uh, uh, you know, an, uh, uh, the balance sheet result when that comes out from the Fed. I do think you're going to see access, and that's going to tell you that the Fed is putting, you know, um, I guess facilities in place to, to prevent the liquidity crisis from becoming worse. And at that point, I think volatility uh, does subside. The market always overdoes things because we have positions on and then you have to take it off or you get stopped out. But I think you take a step back and the economy is still strong. If we can, it's been a week, it's been actually three days. If we can, if the Fed can come in and provide these facilities and we can stop these fire sales, yeah. I think we can all, you know, calm down a little bit. Priya, thank you for that. Priya Misra there of TD Securities. The Priya's point, <clears throat> Tom, it's been three days. So all these calls on the Federal Reserve, I get it. You've got to make a call. Maybe you've got to reassess things in light of what's happening in markets as well. But Tom, all these calls, where are we in a week's time? I, where are we in two days? I, we, don't, we don't know. This is what's known as uncertainty, where you don't even have a set of outcomes. You have no outcome. You have, you're, you're literally, to use the phrase, flying blind. What I would suggest is you look at the screen, and the summation statistic for me is how restrictive we've become with all these gyrations looking at the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. Jerome Powell is looking at a, I'll let, I'll let an adverb come in here from our guests, sure. a highly restrictive or super restrictive market. That was not the case four days ago. This conversation is going to continue. We'll catch up with Phil Camparelli, portfolio manager at JP Morgan Asset Management, a little bit later this morning in the next hour. I want to whip through the price action for you. If you are just tuning in, your equity market is positive on the S&P by about a half of 1%. If you'd like to know where a couple of names are, First Republic is higher by a little more than 20% in the pre-market after getting absolutely battered in the last few days. Credit Suisse want to watch, down 4%, down again. Down again over in Switzerland, 216 on Credit Suisse. And in the bond market, yields aggressively lower the last couple of days, higher this morning by about three basis points. Your 10-year, 360, 73. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Ukraine's Vladimir Zelensky are said to be planning a video call in what would be their first conversation since Russia's invasion. The Wall Street Journal reported it could come after Xi visits Moscow, a trip which may happen next week. President Biden, meanwhile, says he expects to speak with China's leader soon once the government in Beijing returns to work following the National People's Congress. The U.S. system of federal home loan banks is ramping up the amount of cash it has available to deploy as a failure of several U.S. lenders sparks expectations that more regional lenders will need to tap it for funds. The FHLB system, a key source of cash for regional lenders, raised $88.7 billion through the sale of short-term notes exceeding the $64 billion initially planned. Fannie Mae has postponed the sale of more than $500 million of mortgage-linked bonds sold by Nomura and Morgan Stanley. Now, Bloomberg has learned Fannie Mae alerted investors that the deal, a $542 million credit risk transfer security, would be delayed, citing market conditions. Securities are riskier than regular Fannie Mae mortgage bonds because they're among the first to take losses when homeowners fail to make payments. U.S. prosecutors are looking into chat group conversations among prominent trading firms about a potential bailout of the Terra USD stablecoin project. Manhattan federal prosecutors are probing conversations on Telegram among employees at Jump, Jane Street, and the now bankrupt FTX affiliate Alameda Research last May and whether possible market manipulation was involved. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Americans can rest assured that our banking system is safe. Your deposits are safe. 
Let me also assure you, we will not stop at this. We'll do whatever is needed. I'm going to ask Congress and the banking regulators to strengthen the rules for banks to make it less likely this kind of bank failure would happen again and to protect American jobs and small businesses. The President of the United States there, live from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. After that address and after what we heard Sunday evening from officials, the Treasury, the Fed, the FDIC, a lot of people in this market thought we might get a bounce in some of these small regionals, the banks. First Republic was lower on the day by 60% plus. Western Alliance was down by almost 50%. Comerica Keycorp, both down about 27%. Lisa, I think a lot of people found that surprising. This morning, you do get a bounce, finally, on Tuesday, by more than 20%. But what was yesterday about? Well, I think that was the reason why people got very nervous, and that was part of the move that we saw in the two-year yield. If what the Federal Reserve and what the FDIC did was not enough to stave some of the panic, what would be? This morning, however, I do wonder if we see the whipsaw in the other direction, given that Comerica shares up more than 10 percent, Western Alliance shares up almost 20 percent, PacWest shares also absolutely surging, I believe more than 30 percent. So how much do you get this sort of sense of relief today? Just delay a day. We say we're data dependent, Tom dependent on what data, dependent on the prices of those names, or dependent on the prices that we get at 8.30 Eastern time in CPI? You're going to be careful with the data dependency there. To me, it's two separate issues now. Clearly, the financial part takes predominance over the economic part, but are they linked? Yes, they're linked. I, I'm sorry, there, there seems to be a belief that we've escaped flow angst of Thursday, Friday, Monday. I don't buy it for a minute. People have these things, yep. and they're game changer I, I, at all levels. And I just, my frame of mind here is, as John, you've been doing, we've got to follow these stocks that have the interior pulse of that flow angst. Dan Iverson, PIMCO, speaking to the team here at <clears throat> yeah. Bloomberg yesterday, said this could be a multi-month process, Tom. Not a couple of days, could be a multi-month process to adjust to some of this. Now we're going to take a different perspective here. Magnus Billing joining us. He's the chief executive officer of Sweden's Electa, and we're thrilled he could join us uh, this morning here with perspective on the American banks and with perspective on the pension responsibilities in his Sweden across Europe and, frankly, at worldwide. Magnus, the path is this. October of last year, a small matter of a busted sure thing in the United Kingdom, a bailout by the Bank of England literally in hours what we've all observed over the last four days, and we look at Sweden as the bastion. What are the shadows within the Swedish pension system right now? Is it pricing commercial real estate? Is it different nuances of, of European banking? What, what are the shadows you confront this morning? Well, good, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. I think, first of all, that the Swedish bank, uh, pension system is very robust. Uh, it's more robust than it's been in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, but having said that, obviously, end of the day, it's a lot about liquidity when the psychology kicks in into mm -hmm. the market space. And I think the, the issue that you brought up about the UK event that took place last year and also what we see now in the past uh, week or so is a lot of liquidity, psychology around the liquidity and the easiness one can move capital today with the digital uh, development that we've seen in the past number of years. Uh, but uh, looking at just the balance sheet of basically across all the pension funds in Sweden and the Nordic region, they are very robust today. Do you bring the money home? My experience on the geography of crisis is when in doubt, pull it home. Do Swedish pension plans and would you guess European continental plans, do they just bring the assets home? I think the underlay underlying fundamentals of the US market is still very attractive for any investor. Uh, so I think in the mid to long term, US uh, will always be able to attract uh, investors to invest uh, into the market space. That goes also for the pension funds. And I think looking at the size of many of the pension funds in, in the Nordics and the European uh, space, uh, they need to uh, diversify into the US market and other regions of, around the globe. So I think uh, uh, I have at least a, a positive mid to long term view on the US market's capacity to deliver shareholder value to us. And Magnus, you have a problem this morning, as most people know. So let's talk about that problem now. How does a Swedish pension fund 
end up allocated to Signature Bank, First Republic and SVP? Yeah, I mean, we've been, uh, we invested in those companies starting 2017 uh, up until 2019, and, and we've been growing that allocation over the years. So obviously, we thought that uh, the initial year was good for us in investing that, but uh, with what's happened last week, obviously, we think it's, uh, it's a big failure for us as, uh, as an investor, and we need to learn something from that and take actions based upon the lessons learned. So it's a failure. I just want to sort of put that in proportion to the total total portfolio that we're managing. We're talking about 1% uh, of our total capital that we manage. So uh, from a customer point of view, this does not have a material impact at all. It will not impact the pensions that we are uh, committing to our customers. I understand that, uh, but it does speak to weak internal controls and yeah. some odd decisions that we need to talk about, yeah. Magnus. The fact that you were allocated to those names, but some of the conservative Swedish lenders, you ended up selling those positions in 2022. So I guess the question that will be repeatedly asked of you is just what happened? What happened and why did you buy more of those names and sell more conservative names? Well, they, they, those are two separate issues. Uh, the, uh, the divestment of the uh, Swedish banks is a standalone uh, assessment of the decision made, made at a different time. Talking about the US banks, uh, what we liked about them was the market position, uh, the position when it comes to transformation in the digital space and the US market, generally speaking, the depth of that and the, the, the size of it. Uh, we had discussion with uh, Silicon Valley Bank during the fall because we also saw, as many others, you know, the, the withdrawal of deposits and the uh, uh, investments the company did in the long-term uh, government securities and what that led when it comes to duration and liquidity aspects. Uh, we thought that the action plan that the company had was uh, they were transparent about that and we thought it was well thought through. Uh, then last week the company acted uh, not in accordance with the action plan we had discussed and talked with them about and that yeah. we had been presented to. And that surprised us and I think that was uh, a big mistake from the company's side. Well, clearly, Magnus, it didn't just surprise you, it surprised many people, including the regulator here in the United States. So a lot of people have questions they'll need to answer as well. I want to understand how you've responded to that in the last couple of days. So you've identified some banks that you hold that haven't managed their interest rate risk properly. Are you worried that you also hold some European banking names that maybe are in the same position, perhaps even worse, given what's happened with the bond market there over the last couple of years? We see in the European market as well uh, withdrawal of deposits uh, and it's increasing. So we, we're monitoring that very closely and we're monitoring basically the, the whole exposure we have to the banking sector, which is in total 2% of the total portfolio. So I think uh, we need the last few days has been, you know, ex escalating a little bit in the European market, but we're not monitoring that. I think the loss to uh, equity ratio is completely different or very different in the European space compared to some of the banks in the US market that you mentioned earlier. Magnus, can we just focus on Europe just a little bit more? Do you hold Credit Suisse? No, we don't. Have you sold any names in the last 24 hours, the last 48 hours? Have you de-risked around the European banks at all in any way, shape or form? We have not. We, have, we hold shares in two Nordic banks. SCB and uh, Nordea. You also, though, have taken on these credit risk transfers over the past few years, or basically you take on the risk associated with particularly European bank books tied to commercial loans, distressed debt. How confident are you that those are going to be solid investments? I think the banking sector in Europe is stronger than uh, uh, where they were in uh, prior to the global financial crisis. Uh, so I think we're in a better starting position. Uh, obviously, a lot of things are happening right now, and it, it's clearly a transition phase that the market is going through with the enormous uh, increase in the interest rate that we've seen in the past 12 months and the speed of that. Uh, and uh, we haven't transitioned through that yet. Uh, but I think the banks, the Nordic banks that, uh, that we hold shares in are in a solid position uh, as of today. Given the bet that you made on some of the U.S. banks, I'm wondering how you're handling the fallout, whether you're getting out of the positions, whether you're doubling down, whether you're buying more. What's been sort of the positioning over the past couple of days? 
Well, when you talk about the Silicon Valley Bank and the Signature Bank uh, being in a receivership, I think it's more a legal issue for us to, to ensure that we uh, protect our legal rights there. I don't expect any value to come out of that as of today. When it comes to uh, First Republic, uh, obviously, the, the, it's very volatile and, and it's day to day, basically. Yesterday it, it fell a lot, today it's up again. We. Uh, <coughs> We will. We haven't taken any decision yet, but we are ready to take decisions as we see appropriate for us at any stage. But we haven't taken any major actions today with regard to that bank. Magnus, every crisis unfolds with a certain character. We make note of Sweden's wonderful work many, many decades ago in inventing a whole bit of central bank theory with how Stockholm invent, uh, handled a crisis. The theme right now seems to be the shadows or the mysteries of private equity and venture capital. In America, conservative money is addicted to the potential return of that group. Are you exposed to private equity and venture capital, long-term locked-in holdings, and do you worry that there could be some real issues there with liquidity? In our equity portfolio, our investment model is predominantly focused on uh, more mature companies, and we invest directly in those. So uh, we're looking for strong cash flow rather mm -hmm. than potential growth and, and future uh, positive cash flow. With that said, that means that we don't we right. basically don't have any private equity exposure and VC exposure in our portfolio. You've been doing this for a few years. Do you assume in crisis, with the way yields are gyrating, the way all central banks have become more restrictive in the last four or five days, do you suggest that not the actuarial assumption, but just the expected return of pension portfolios will come down? Yes, I, I do think that the next 10 years will be more difficult to generate return. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we will see changes in the investment models uh, in the pension fund industry in order to secure right. adequate return for, for the beneficiaries. Sir, my great theme here is we've had interest rate come in as we've come back and normalized yield, certainly normalized yield uh, within the European sphere as well. Is it troubled non-profitable companies, what we call in America zombies, that they will go away, whether they're banks or anything else as well? Do you suggest that we will see combinations and transactions to clear out companies that have had essentially a free lunch for 16 years? Yeah, I do think some companies are uh, have benefited uh, too much or... or uh, of the central bank's put and, and the fact that we've been living in a world for many years where cost of capital has been basically zero. Uh, and I don't think that that is sustainable in the long term. And I would su su suspect that some businesses out there will struggle to adjust to more normalized interest rate level long term. Magnus, as you and I are talking, as we're all speaking, the first deputy governor of the Swedish central bank is addressing parliament at the moment, suggesting that we need more tightening despite volatility. There are people who believe that things are breaking now and these central banks need to back away. Can we finish on that? What's your take on that? So I didn't hear the question properly, so could you...? I can repeat it, sir, by all means. So the first deputy governor of the Riksbank is speaking to parliament right now suggesting that we need more tightening despite the volatility. Magnus, as you know, the conversation in the last 24 hours is that people, some people believe things are breaking and central banks should back away. What's your take on that, sir? I do think that we in the market space today uh, actually see a de facto tightening. Uh, and I think that should be catered in, into the policy decisions to be made going forward. Uh, and I, it's very difficult assessments to make, obviously, but I'm a little bit concerned that we're breaking the, sis breaking the markets if we're too aggressive. Uh, obviously, we need to bring down the inflation because that is uh, the long-term uh, number one foe for, for all the market participants. But it's a balancing act here. And I, I think, again, that the current de facto market tightening that's happening should be catering into that consideration. Magnus, it's a difficult time for everyone, particularly for you this morning, and we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you at that difficult time. Thanks for being with us. Magnus Billing there of Elector, a Swedish pension fund with exposure to all the wrong names.
over the last three days, that's for sure. If you are just tuning in, good morning to you. We're going to whip through some price action just to give you a feel of where things stand at the moment. Your equity market on the S&P 500, slightly positive, slightly negative at the close in yesterday's session on the S&P 500 at the moment. We're positive by about a half of 1% on the S&P. In the bond market, yields are a little bit higher by four basis points on a 10-year, 361.49, a whole lot higher at the front end after being a whole lot lower over the last three days. Three days, 100 basis points lower, just unbelievable. This morning, your two-year up 27 basis points. I think two names for many of you stand out this morning and over the last couple of days on both sides of the Atlantic. Let's start with the US side of things. First Republic is positive after being slaughtered over the last couple of days. It's up by 22%. And Lisa Credit Suisse at the moment is down about 4.8%. We're trading at 214 and just off record lows, session lows. And to be clear, this isn't just the fallout from what we saw in the banking sector. It's also because there's a new headline. Uh, they can't catch a break with this, that they found material control lapses after the SEC prompt in some of their reporting in 2022 and 2021, even though uh, they say that it fairly presents its financial condition. But these are not things that you want to read about at a time where there are questions about uh, the integrity of balance sheets on certain banks and when you've got all of these jitters well, around who's the strongest. I read that. It was a really short statement here. We've got, John, I want to go over these headlines from Credit Suisse here. Sure. I think they're very important. I'll let you lead on that. But I think what is important here, Lisa, is PricewaterhouseCoopers made that happen. There's no question in my mind that the American audit system stepped up and said, no, we're not going to agree to this. And PwC came in and said, eh, maybe not. So we've got two things, haven't we? One, Lisa mentioned it. <clears throat> it fairly captured, they think, their results. Okay. That's one part of this story. That doesn't mean the story's done. No. Credit Suisse turns around and said they've got problems with their internal controls, TK. That's the last thing you want to be saying at a time where the stock's near a record low. Yeah. And we know there's been management issues there for a long, long time. My experience is with accounting, it's always ratios, compare and contrast. And I'm not going to pontificate as the numerator of a given ratio bad or the denominator. But my guess is the audit adults are looking at the construction of their ratios and saying maybe it's a little off here, maybe it's a little mysterious there. What's important to me is that PwC stepped in here. I just wonder who's going to come in and be the white knight here, because this is a story that's been bleeding to record lows when you look at the stock prices and people are wondering, OK, well, what's the solution <clears throat> here? This isn't necessarily a bail in, a bailout, call it whatever no. you want. This is something else. And the potential for Middle East investors to come take over is what everybody keeps floating. Jen, I'm going to do this right now. I don't ever, ever, ever do this, but I'll do a fancy technical analysis. And this is off of three moving averages. And the answer is Credit Suisse opened, went south, 222 down to 215. I'm looking at a 10-minute interval chart for those keeping score at home. And John, there's a middle moving average that this stock can't break through. One, two, three, four, five, six intervals. They've tried to go through and they can't bid it up. Right on cue. Just got told some, some fantastic news. Walking into the building in London, the Credit Suisse boss, the CEO, is going to sit down with Francine Lacroix your first question? in about 90 seconds. Well, let's start with the news first, right? Got to start with the news first and got to start with the fact the stock's at a record low. TK, how much trouble are we really facing here yeah, the, with this name? And the key question, and it's so foreign for me because I really, you know, we make jokes about it, folks, but let's be honest, we're flying blind here. Signature Bank, I wasn't surprised because I know the heritage of New York State regulation. They're really, really serious. I don't have a clue about Swedish, uh, Swiss regulators, excuse me, Switzerland uh, regulators, but John... I mean, in America, you're under five, you're under four, everybody sits up and watches. We're under, we're going to be under two here in a bit. How do you project confidence when it's been one bad headline after another? This is the really difficult question. How do you basically garner inflows, <clears throat> whether it's wealth management or depositors, at a time where we have already this incredible competition with other banks? And then how much does the pressure from what's going on in the U.S. really add to the difficulties in reshoring a lot of the support that they've had from previous investors? That conversation coming up very, very shortly. The Credit Suisse CEO sitting down with... Francine Lacqua, looking forward to that conversation. Just waiting for them to get settled, and we'll pass over to that in just a moment. I'm going to go three things for you. Just start with equities, then go to bonds and finish on foreign exchange. And interesting to hear the Swedish pension fund turn around and say they're seeing <coughs> deposit outflows in certain places in Europe yeah. too. Yeah. That's the problem. And, Tom, we talked about the duration issue 
as well, the duration issue over in Europe. If you think that some US banks have mismanaged their interest rate risk, well, think about stop. what's happened this to duration is, in Europe over the last 12 months. This is really important. John is really, really quite good on this. John, we look at America at seven years, the belly of the curve, the outside of it. Ten years is the benchmark. We go out to 30 years. Pension funds over there, much more conservative outside of crisis. Don't they feel comfortable locking in a 25-year piece? Certainly the story in the, in the gilt piece. market, yeah, in yeah. the UK, which is why we have such a much longer-weighted average maturity yeah. in the gilt market too. Equity futures right now on the S&P just about positive by four-tenths of 1%. Big turnaround in the bond market relative to what you've seen over the last few days. Your two-year yield now is higher by 26 basis points after being lower by 100 basis points in just three days. We can now head over to London to catch up with Francine Lacroix and the Credit Suisse CEO. Thank you so much, John. We are delighted to be joined by, of course, Ulrich Kerner, the Credit Suisse Chief Executive Officer. Thank you for joining us. It's a difficult day, another difficult day for Credit Suisse. What can you tell us about the outflows in the wake of SVB? So SVB, as you know, is a very recent um, thing which happened over the weekend and yesterday. So far, it's pretty calm. Mm -hmm. um, we even saw material good inflows yesterday still. Um, also, you know, I had a client meeting which was very positive on that one. So, so far it's calm, but I think it's early yeah. days to, to look at that. Uh, calm, are you suggesting that you could also actually get inflows? So we as got people inflows change. yesterday, which is a positive sign, I would say. Um, and, you know, for us, and, and that is maybe a little bit, if I may say so, from seeing in comparison to SVB, it's a very different situation, you know. We are GSIP, as you know, we are following mm -hmm. materially different and higher standards when it comes to capital funding, liquidity, and so on. And that's why we said, you know, we gave, I think in this situation okay. is important, we gave LCR liquidity uh, capital ratio of like 140-40 at, mm -hmm. at the end of Q4, which is a strong ratio, which has improved as we went through this quarter to like 150 on average and spot being even higher on that yeah. one. So. But out, so outflows have not reversed, but they've actually lowered. As when are they reversing? Look, they have significantly moderated, as I put it. We gave an update on February 9 in terms of where we are on deposits and net new assets and so on. We will give next update with the first quarter result. But it is also very clear, you know, if, and we talked about that, what has happened in, in like fourth quarter, you know, um, we are fully focused on it, turn it around, but that takes longer than like just two months. It, it, but then you, do, you have this material weakness today. What happened there? there? There's concern that actually almost every day there's some kind of bad news and you have your share price at a record low. Like that can't be a comfortable position. No, but we, we published our annual report today. So you have seen the financial result. I think that's the key message. The financial result is unchanged for 2022 no. and previous years. We delayed the report as you have seen a couple of days to appropriately deal with you know questions the SEC had and we did yeah. uh, and that is part of a longer ongoing dialogue and we acknowledge that we have a material weakness in the financial in the financial reporting control which we are addressing and remediating forcefully. So. How are you addressing that? So is that an auditor problem? You had PwC on the case, is it their fault? No, it's absolutely not their fault. Uh, that is obviously, you know, that goes hand in hand as, as you work together with your auditor but it's a collective finding and we are addressing it. We have remediation plan and we are addressing it. So you, you have a, an anchor investor that put 1.5 million in the bank. Now their share value has gone down by one third. Will they have to inject more? What kind of conversations are you having with them? No, look, nobody's pleased about the share price development, you know, but we manage what we can manage. And this is the execution of our plan. That's the right strategy, it's the right plan. We are executing at pace and even ahead of the plan. And I think our shareholders see that as well. That's an unpleasant situation in share price, but I can't manage share price. I can manage no. the execution, and I do. So you, you don't think you're, you're getting pressure from shareholders? You're not getting pressure from, you know, certain big shareholders to do more and actually to have all options on the table? No, as I said, they are obviously, they are obviously not pleased with the development. And I'm not pleased with the development in the first hand, obviously, but, you know, we are executing. And once we are executing step by step, we show the market, and this is exactly why we said it's a three years process. And, and we are executing. And that is, you know, the market will acknowledge that and the share price will, will follow. Do you think all options should be on the table? What about breaking up the bank? If you look, and I understand your frustration with the share price and saying, look, you're just executing. But when you look at the share price, 97% below that 2007 high. Like, how do you regain from that? No, but that you can, can't compare, as you know. But, you know, as, a, as I said, it's a wide strategy. 
I'm fully, com fully convinced of the strategy. We are executing at Paris. We have the right team. And you know, that's why we said in October, it needs radical change. You know, the bank needs to be changed. And we said it's yeah. a three years transformation and you can't come after two, two months and say, look, yes. why is not everything done? But radical change could be splitting up the bank. Is it something that you're, you're evaluating? No, look, the new credit Suisse is focused on the core strengths of the bank. This is wealth management, the Swiss bank business, asset management, the, what we put the market, i.e. the trading and sales business. That makes mm -hmm. entirely sense. Entirely different risk profile. Will be very profitable and will reward shareholders. And I think the shareholders understand that. When will you be able to say, like, the worst is really behind us? Well, we said it's three years transformation. We said we are going to make a loss, unfortunately, this year, because, you know, and this is something which you need to understand. A lot of the restructuring costs, you know, yep. baked into the transformation are coming in 2023 before we see a lot of benefits um, out of that transformation. And that is something which happens. That's why we said it takes three years. Three years is a long time, Ulrich. I mean, a, a lot time, of the share, yeah. but a lot of the shareholders will start asking questions. I mean, have you asked them for more money to make it faster? No, Three I years, our, especially in this banking world, anything could happen. No, but you know, as I said, our LCR ratio is strong and very strong. Has 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 getting stronger as we speak. Our capital ratio is very strong at 14.1 percent, as we gave it to Q4. So we have everything we need to go through the transformation miles. Are, are you expecting you know, the first quarter to be good enough to keep shareholders off your back? The first quarter is, is, as we said, and we put it very clearly, we will make a loss in the first quarter, but you will see progress in the first quarter numbers. No in, question. In, in terms of what outflows in certain in regions? In terms of business momentum? Where specifically? Example, business momentum? In the market business, for example, which was, as, as we all discussed, for, the, for, for reasons, clearly understandable reasons, weak in the Q4, looks better. Wealth management, we are making progress. Certainly not that there where we should be, but we are making progress. Are, are, are you comfortable with the banking system as a whole? I mean, we've, we've you know, lived through a pretty incredible couple of days. And if you look at the markets, they're all over the place. No, I think so. I mean, this is, this is somewhat an isolated problem if you want to. And as I said, you know, if you are GCPIT or if you look at large banks, I think we will manage through it. Uh, talk to me a little bit about Credit Suisse First Boston. So first of all, what's the timeline for the IPO? The timeline for seen is unchanged, as we discussed last time. So we have a very clear plan to put it into market, create a liquidity event, most likely an IPO. We are working against our internal plans forcefully, and I would expect such an event in like 2025, as I said earlier. Okay. Any news? I mean, today you had news about the you know 20% that would go to Credit Suisse First Boston Partners. What happens to the rest? The rest is owned by us and, and, and obviously also portioned by Michael, uh, as, as, we, yeah. as we announced it in like February. And the rest is owned by us. So this is, this is our, our part of the bank, remains our part of the bank. We are going into liquidity and again, most likely IPO. We will be probably majority shareholder. And then we make decision, you know, how our holding develops over the next yeah. following years. So you're still looking for an anchor investor? Yeah, for Credit Suisse for Boston, are, are you closer to finding one? I, will, I, I don't know. Yeah, we are close to, but uh, I'm not sure if it's anchor investor. We have a lot of interest uh, from no. third parties to be invested into that, which tells you something about the strategy, I would say. No. And we are evaluating that. M Middle Eastern investors? Different kind of investors, different parts of the world. But, but large chunk Rob investors. Made decision, and I will inform you first. As you oh, okay, H how far away are we from that? We are pretty close, I would say. A couple of weeks? Would it, will it come before the first quarter? I will tell the market if we are there. What do you find most difficult about your job? Is, is to make it understandable, I would say, you know, that we are absolutely doing the right things, that we need yeah. some time to get through. And, and this is what all my colleagues and I try to do, you know, to regain the trust of the bank over the next couple of months. But is it more important to regain the trust of shareholders or, do, or clients? It is. Look, clients is, I told you last time, clients is, I would say, one of the best experience even in this very difficult months last year. I mean, they are so supportive of us. They are listening to us. They are doing active things to support. They like to bank with Credit Suisse. It's yeah. a fantastic experience. But, you know, the convincing of... This is the right thing to do. We are executing at pace, and the head of plan is with all different stakeholders, all different ones. But why are they taking money out then, if, if, if your clients are happy? Because, and that's, that's what I also said, if you are in a situation like we were in October, 
you know, where you had malicious information out in the market at the beginning of October, we were not able to speak, legally not able no. to speak. And that's why I said, like two thirds of the outflows stemming from October alone, 85% from October and November. And the moment we could reach out, right. we started that huge program, talked to our clients, more than 10,000 clients in wealth management since then, more than 50,000 individual meetings in Switzerland, and that has created momentum. Are, are you frustrated, though, that actually you haven't been able to get ahead of that quicker? No, I think we, we, we are really doing the utmost possible, and I'm proud, not frustrated, I'm proud of what my colleagues, my people at the front units have done since months. I'm really proud of. But the, the message today, I mean, if you look at your share price, you're proud, you think you're executing, you're on a three-year plan. If you look at the share price at a record low, does, it, does your stomach sink a little bit when you look at the As share I said, price? No, nothing which I like, obviously. But look, I can control what I can control. I don't control the share price. I control the execution of the right strategy. And, and you think the share price will, will catch up if, if you it execute? Will. All right, thank you so much for your time. Thank that you. was Ulrich Kerner there, the Credit Suisse Chief Executive Officer. And with that, I'm going to send it back to you. Hey, Francine, just absolutely fantastic. What a timely conversation speaking to the Credit Suisse CEO out of London this morning. <coughs> Credit Suisse down by 4.9% still. The stock at about 215. The headline we got from the Credit Suisse CEO. I have to say, surprised by this line. Tom, surprised to hear it. The Credit Suisse CEO saying the firm saw client inflows. On Monday. Okay, it's one day. You know, I, you know, I'll go with that, and I guess it's a triumph as, as well. I, I think a lot of people, and I'm really looking at the what's called the 10-minute interval stock, and this is not what we do in surveillance, but the fact is this is the mood of a crisis financial world at right now. He could. The fact, the fact is during Francine's wonderful interview, he didn't generate a bid on the Bloomberg screen. Nope. There was no bid during that conversation. I think Francine did a wonderful job asking all the right questions. He's in a tough spot, though, to answer them he, right now, he, Tom. He, that line that we'll see progress in Q1 numbers, you get Q1 results on the 27th of April. 27th of April feels like a long, long way away. I think? No, I feel like a week right now in this world. I said this yesterday. In a world where a bank can fail in like 24 hours, as we saw with Signature Bank, yeah. as we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, a month's a long time. Uh, 27th of April, first of all, that's when the Red Sox are out of the pennant race. But other than that, it's way too far out. And it t in his defense, these guys are hardwired to look out strategically, except he did not answer the present tensions in crisis, other than to say, I believe he said they're close to large pools of money uh, coming in. Francine and I went back and forth on that before uh, her great conversation. The fact is he should have identified the immediacy. And as I see here at 2.145, and you know, I'm not gonna go, we're not going to make this a technical show, John, but the answer is he didn't find a bid on the chart. So, Tom, language is important. And one of the many reasons I'm honoured hosting this show every morning with you guys is the audience out there, particularly the terminal user, one of the sharpest, smartest yes. audiences, I think, Wired on the planet. Him. This note right here across the Bloomberg, he didn't say net inflows. Yeah. He said client mm. inflows, he didn't say net inflows. And I think that's probably an important distinction, Lisa. He also said when Francine asked how much are they seeing some sort of positive growth in the first quarter, he said he's, we're seeing progress. Yeah. She said, what kind of progress? And he said business momentum. And she said client inflows. He said business momentum. So this is going to be a question What is business ongoing. momentum? Uh, you tell me, TK. No you idea. Know, hold a party at Brasserie Lip in Zurich. Okay, Francine, uh, excuse me, Francine Abramowitz. Lisa, you're better at this than I am. Can uh, you Francine's tell us? Francine's new name. Yeah, you know, it's, it's she Lisa. and I, we're going to get out of this. Family. Yeah, folks, it's been six days of no sleep. Let's, let's use that as the excuse. Lisa, you know the symbols for this. What does their debt structure look like now, including their credit default swaps? Well, if you look at the perpetual bonds, uh, their credit default swaps are pricing in a, a near record uh, level of distress. But if you take a look at their perpetual bonds, they were traded actively yesterday and sinking to some of the lowest levels we've seen. Look, right now, you are seeing the market raise signals <laughs> of concern about this bank. Question is, given how far it's fallen, what can it do to resurrect it? Was that discussion enough? The market's saying no. Yeah, it's rolled over again. Yep. Stock's down 5%, Tom. 214 on Credit Suisse. Well, and again, we're, we, maybe we'll get the screen up here at some point, folks, because, you know, we, we just don't want to do a fancy thing here. But the answer is we will continue to monitor Credit Suisse. I've got just as, as initial resistance, folks, for those keeping score, 2.5, excuse, 2.15, 2.16. That's two, two, what are they? What, are they Sun teams? 
pennies? What do you call a hundredth of a Swiss franc? Keep going. A Frankie? I don't know. We can call it a Frankie if you want. The Swiss are going to love you this morning. We're going to migrate right now off of Credit Suisse and go to another bank that starts with C. Doing much better this morning, and that would be Citigroup. He is chief uh, U.S. economist at Citigroup, Andrew Hollenhorst. Andrew, you have led the way on some form of vector to get to higher interest rates. This is where we're going. Did they go too far too fast? I, I think we don't know, Tom. I, I think we're going to find out that it's not the case that they've gone too far or that they've gone too fast. Um, but the, the Fed is managing three different things. They want to achieve price stability. They want to achieve financial stability. And they want to achieve full employment. We've been in a situation right. where <clears throat> the only one issue was price stability, inflation that was too high. Now they have to balance between financial stability and okay. price stability. I went back pre Volcker, Andrew, and the and the second the first derivative rather of what they accomplished going from next to zero, John knows the numbers better than me, up to the new rate. It's never been such a steep movement. Did they cause this fight did, did Jerome to keep it simple and sensational, and with great respect to the chairman, did his trajectory with his Fed compatriots, did that cause this financial upset we're living now? Well, I Causation is a difficult question because we know that higher interest rates had to do with what's going on in the banking system now. Now, did the Fed cause higher interest rates? I would argue that inflation caused higher interest rates. You're going to get higher interest rates because inflation was higher. Now we have the Fed moving against inflation, which is the appropriate thing for the Fed to do. As that process happens, think about what the Fed is trying to achieve. They are trying to tighten credit conditions they are trying to slow the economy. You'd like that to happen gradually. Yeah. You'd like that to happen smoothly. But does it in practice? Usually not. So certainly not the objective for a bank to fail. Um, and I don't know that we can say that that was caused by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is moving to slow inflation. That is going to have collateral damage along the way. And I think we've been talking about that for at least a year now, that the Fed should be honest about the fact that when you raise interest rates, yeah. you're slowing the economy, you're constraining credit, it is painful. And Andrew, that's what we're seeing now. Andrew, you still think that we're heading to five and a half to five and three quarters percent of an interest rate, a terminal interest rate. I'm curious how lonely that feels, how difficult that's becoming to defend at a time where people are saying, basically, the Fed's done. Yeah, it's really interesting, Lisa. So we've been on the phone talking to clients about this for um, you know, what feels like an eternity, which has really been just the last couple of days. Um, and, and I think consensus is really, there is no consensus here. Um, there are those that think that this could materialize into a bigger financial sector problem. If that's the case, if we continue to experience the kind of volatility that we experienced yesterday, would the Fed be hiking throughout that? Probably not. Would we get to those higher rates? Probably not. Um, would we have a risk to economic growth that would bring inflation down, potentially. So I think that there is that scenario. But when I look at what's going on, I do not see that as the likely scenario. I think what we have going on now is still relatively constrained to one part of the economy. We have deposits that are moving around the banking system that are not net flowing out of the banking system. Um, at least as we can see so far, and that's something that everybody's going to be monitoring. So that, that that risk is there, that there's going to be a financial stability issue that prevents the Fed from hiking further. Um, but I think the early read on this is that that's probably not going to prevent the Fed from hiking further. And then you move back to that price stability issue. If the Fed does not hike next week, there will be real questions about whether the Fed is also committed to price stability. It's very difficult for the Fed because they have to both balance the financial stability and the price stability, not hiking next week would send a signal that perhaps the Fed is not that committed to the price stability mandate. Andrew Hollenhorst, a city. Andrew, rock in a hard place, and I'm with you. There is zero consensus right now. Andrew, thank you very much for joining us. We've all gone through the calls in the last 24 hours, the calls for a pause from the likes of Dan Iverson at PIMCO, suggesting that maybe that's the direction of travel here. Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Barclays, others looking for a pause. The more are looking for more. They're looking for a rate cut, and they're looking for the end of QT as well. There are those, though, City. Tom, I think Bank of America, Mike Gape, and I'll catch up with Mike a little bit later, still looking for a move next week. Yes. And next week, to, to the point oh. that we've all discussed so far this morning, a week is such a long time in this market. 
at yeah, the moment. Well, I'm who, gonna, who knows what CPI looks like at exactly, 8.30 Eastern Exactly. I'm going to get time. to 90 minutes here, and then we'll see if Michael Gapin has to adjust or not. We are all data dependent, but around that is to maintain Greenspan's measured. The person who's had the best four days here is Alan Greenspan. He used to pound the table be measured in the debate there with Andrew, and Andrew clearly stood his ground that he wanted rates higher faster, Greenspan would have said, measure it out. Take your time. Observe the data nationally is where he would have been. We will observe the data at 8.30 CPI, just around the corner. It's inflation this morning, and we've barely discussed it, which tells you about this uh, this market we're yeah. in right now. Futures right now on ESP, positive four tenths of one percent from New York. <clears throat> this is Bloomberg. There's certainly a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear is showing up in the bank stocks. Yes, you are going to see a lot of gyrations in the market because investors are nervous. It's another source of volatility in a highly volatile market. This is not a great backdrop to invest. You're not seeing a meltdown in the equity market. You're not really seeing broader risks of a contagion in all markets. I don't think this is going to lead to a recession. I'm still in the soft landing camp. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen. Jonathan Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. It is CPI Tuesday and hardly anybody is talking about CPI Tuesday. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Your equity market is slightly positive by a half of 1% on the S&P 500. Tom Keane, data 90 minutes away. Data 90 minutes away. We're really trying to look towards it. Let me do a little bit of a vamp on it now. Nothing's changed in terms of the split between goods, disinflation, outright deflation anticipated by some, but service sector, service sector, service sector. And what to me is fascinating, John, nobody's talking about this. All of a sudden, we're going to get down to $2 a gallon gas for the summer. Or, uh, Lisa's getting the Hummer out. I mean, there's no, you know, I mean, got 7908 on Brent. So, could we get a 60 handle on West Texas Intermediate? That helps inflation. And not being talked about this morning because we're talking about the financial services sector. Two <clears> names <throat> stand out, of course. Credit Suisse is just recovering a little bit. It's down about 3.7%. 217, still dramatically low for that name. First Republic battered yesterday, Tom. It's up about 18% this morning. How those small regional banks do in this country today, important given they got absolutely hammered in yesterday's session. I'm sure Secretary Yellen has a team looking at this, and the answer is they've had a good couple of hours of relative calmness after what we saw uh, yesterday. It still comes down to flows. And when Francine Lacroix was speaking with the head of Credit Suisse, he didn't want to talk about flows. Lisa was great on that. Flows net flows net net flows it's like our start i can't make it up client flows got better seems to be the the view they're trying to well, trying to push flows this morning at the american banks as well i hear you i hear you got to talk about the federal reserve as well you've seen all the calls you've heard them here they are so far lisa pimco dan iverson always fantastic to hear from him suggesting we might get that pause goldman Wells fargo Barclays all joining the Pause Brigade, Nomura going one step further, rate cut. We spoke to Andrew Hollenhorst, the city, 10 minutes ago on this programme. And Andrew basically said there is no consensus. I think Andrew acknowledging, yes, he still thinks they're going to hike, but ultimately, who knows where we are in a week's time. The tension right now between inflation that is not dead, that is very much present at some of the highest levels we've seen in four decades, and this concern about financial stability that we still haven't seen fully shake out, right? I mean, have we seen the end of it? Does the bounce today and some of these shares really indicate that we have passed the corner on this, to me, that's unresolved. How does the market handle a hot CPI print today? What kind of whipsaw action do you get when suddenly people priced out the Fed yesterday and have to reprice in 5.5% Fed funds rates today? You could see some real gyrations at a time where the implied volatility right now in the bond market is the highest going what's back the, what's to 2009. What's the index look like? I haven't looked. Is it's it like... an absolute surge to the yeah. highest level since 2009. It didn't just price out hikes. Priced in loads of cuts. Just the reassessment yesterday was just phenomenal. 60 basis point move at the front end of the curve. Yeah. Come on, 100 basis and points this is in three about, days. I, I, From north of five to south of four. I, I, got, I did the thing for Twitter and YouTube yesterday, and I said, where is Jerome Powell? And if I was a president, I would be having Secretary Yellen and Chairman Powell speak. To say People what? Hear, but to it, say what? I mean, honestly, what are they going to do? Come out, we have no clue either. Institutions in crisis should speak. When, when surveillance is in crisis, John Farrow speaks. Tries to. Tries yeah. to. <laughs> Tries to. Can I just say this? What a timely arrival of Lael Brainerd to the National Economic Council, Tom. 
What a timely arrival for her to be there with the administration at a yes, time like this. Yeah, well, she's be, any place she arrives, I like her to manage the Red Sox. But, you know, I, the answer the answer is yes, it's hugely timely and, and will be of great assistance. My, my question in, in to this morning to all of America, particularly people that aren't fancy on this, is, is you've got, I lost my train of thought, three, two, one. You've got to tr you got to listen to the public, and they're scared stiff. That hasn't gone away. I lose I mean, my train of thought every time Lisa starts laughing at me too. Why are you laughing? What's well, Brandon, because he said Lael Brainerd. Yeah. <laughs> it's very timely. It's very Entrance. timely. Yeah. Okay. So are you basically saying that she helped to orchestrate this, to basically offset what uh, she sees weekend. happening? No. Yeah. No, I, I would never she, say I that. I would have thought she had a massive John role. John and I would right. never well, Isn't say it safe to assume, as the chief economic advisor to the president, that she, she had has, a big role to play right, over the so weekend? I wonder what her assessment, <clears throat> look, having worked at the Fed, would be. I'm just saying, timely, she, okay. It <laughs> wasn't a loaded, look, timely. Look, no, just, just a know, little timely. Loaded. Here's the <laughs> history. Let me go through the historic path on this, including a final lunch I had with a wonderful Anna Schwartz just before she fell. She was in her 90s. Friedman Schwartz. And then Alan Meltzer and Milton Friedman in, in that range. And then a guy named Ben Bernanke is the one that codified that the strength of the financial system is what keeps a Fed going in crisis. That's where we are now. And Brainerd, to your point, John, studied this linkage in history of finance. I think the Chris, Va Chris Whalen's one volume on this is brilliant. Yeah. The, 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 the financial system linked in to central bank babble. The media, we're, all three of us are guilty of this. We do the parlor game. It doesn't matter right now. It just doesn't matter. You mentioned policymakers <clears throat> speaking more, Tom. I think the last thing you want to do when you're sending policy is chase your tail and keep announcing new things. The question we asked yesterday morning, the announcements of Sunday evening, aren't they sufficient? Let's see it play through the market. Quite clearly on Monday, there was still this nervousness. Let's give it another day, give it another day. And the hope is that it is sufficient, they have done enough. I think the more you come out at a time like this and talk even more and come up with something new, <coughs> you're just basically saying everything we announced on <coughs> Sunday didn't work, not enough. I think silence is the perfect response right now from these officials. For I think now, that, we'll see, Lisa. I think, but honestly, I, yeah, you're right. But I think that right now, the fact that the quiet period is right now is actually highly convenient for Fed officials. Because what do you say at a time of just great uncertainty when everyone's just throwing up their hands oh, and saying, we don't know? Out, he could come out with a vetted and prepared statement that I'm sure Vice Chairman Brainerd helped him with. I mean, there's no question. He doesn't have to ad lib this. He can come out with a prepared statement. But and, and frankly, he does it. Am I right, John? We can state even with Credit Suisse with a bid for the last 20 minutes, we can state it's a little more constructive than it was at 3.55 yesterday afternoon. Well, let's go through it, and then Lisa can go through the day ahead for you. So your equity market elevated by a half of 1% on the S&P 500. That's a bounce. A minor loss yesterday of a tenth of 1%, but the sector split was pretty obvious, wasn't it? Financials. No hammered. If you look at the bond market, yields are just a little bit higher by two or three basis points on a 10-year, much, much higher on a two-year. On a two-year yield this morning, we're higher by something like <coughs> 20 basis points plus after drifting aggressively lower over the previous three days. In the FX market, euro dollar 107.16, we're negative a tenth of 1%. We're all fed up this morning with the Federal Reserve. What about the ECB, Bramo? The ECB has got to make a call on Thursday after essentially, and they will hate they me using this language. Thursday? Their language, Are we going to Frankfurt? they were suggesting pretty strongly we'll get 50. I think a lot of people <laughs> in the market took that as a pre-commitment to 50. And now here we are, Lisa, going into Thursday. Yeah, we're going to get there in one second. But I do think right now the ECB is in a much worse position than the Fed because at least the Fed has a couple extra days. And honestly, at this point, a couple extra days, as you've been saying all morning, is like a couple years in this market. 8.30 a.m., we get the February U.S. CPI print. What does this market do with hot inflation? That, to me, is a complete mystery wrapped in the mysteries of the moment. We are expecting core inflation to come down to 5.5% from 5.6% on a year year-over-year -year basis. But what happens if it stays hot at a time when the Fed is still fighting inflation at the fastest pace going back four decades? Today, EU finance ministers are gathering in Brussels. And to your point, John, the reason why I find it really interesting what they have to say is because this is just two days before the ECB's rate decision. And you have seen a complete repricing, not only in the U.S. market, but also in the European markets as far as how fast the ECB will raise rates or not. We're now pricing in a much lower terminal ECB rate and that German two-year fell uh, dramatically yesterday, now only at 2.8% from fully uh, north of 3%, close to 3.4% not so long ago. Today, we also uh, are looking out uh, to the 5.30 p.m. discussion from Fed Governor Michelle Bowman. 
probably not going to be talking about Fed policy since it is the quiet period. She's going to be talking about innovation in the banking system. That will also be interesting right now, considering the innovation in the banking system, John, is out. also uh, mm. potentially in the forefront. Oh, she's I, really not. Has, she's, has that speech been rewritten? I, I, I can't believe that speech is even still on the I, schedule, Tom. She's very, very good, but do you cancel it? It doesn't matter it? how like, phenomenal you are. You would know. have been in Hawaii talking about the banking system, but not oh, addressing what's taken man. place the last week. I mean, you know, or, or giving some it, suggestion what it means for Fed policy. I don't think we're giving away family secrets here, but but many of our guests over the last number of days, they they, they want to come on for the smart conversation, and all of a sudden, uh, well, he won't be able to attend. There's a little bit of that going on. Well, I'm happy to say that this morning, Phil Camparelli at J.P. <clears throat> oh, he's Morgan. Here. Oh, he's here. Phil, do you know what Phil did? He just ran through the rain and said, <laughs> I need to be on I need Bloomberg to be here. surveillance. I need to be here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Phil, it's good to see you. Good morning. Thanks for rushing in. All right. <clears throat> what do you make of this reassessment of the Fed this morning, off yeah. the back of the move we've seen in the last sure. three days? Yeah, so I thought March Madness was a basketball thing. It's not. It's mm -hmm. a capital markets thing. I mean, this is, this is crazy. Um, so one of the things that we'd say is, A, bonds are a really nice place to be, except for last year. And now what we're seeing is you now have a market where bonds are negatively correlated to equities. Now, that's the first thing. The second thing is, if the meeting were today, the Fed would be absolutely tone deaf <laughs> to move rates higher. I don't think we should be questioning whether the tightening cycle is over yet. I think that's premature. But at least for the very near term, it would be hard to believe right. that a move higher in rates would be warranted right now. Without giving away the secrets, mm -hmm. what are you seeing in the last three or four days yeah. as you've had a phone glued to your ear? How are clients reacting? Are they allocating to a new belief, a new position? Yeah. Are they staying pat? Or are they just simply scared stiff? Well, you know what the thing is? We were looking at the entire yield curve last week, and the six-month T-bill was the highest yielding part of the Is that what triggered this was a 5% <laughs> money market fund? A lot of people well, are saying, we had, Lisa, we hit 5.00, and everybody yeah. said, oh, that looks good. That looks pretty good. Right. Well, <clears> and, and I'd also say um, that I, I think the chairman last week had almost an October of 2018 moment. Uh, in October of 18, he said, we're far away from, he ate his Wheaties that morning, far we're far away from, from our neutral rate, and yeah. that caused some havoc in the fourth quarter of 18. I'm just, I'm just not sure why last week in the testimony he was that over-the-top aggressive, and I think that might have triggered some stuff. So what clients are thinking right now is, okay, there's negative correlation with bonds again. And I think that's what people are asking the most. What's the sweet spot part of the curve for us to be able to get protection if other parts of our assets are, are moving lower? And, and for us, I think that's the fun. The five-year part of the curve. The five-year part of the curve offers us the combination of, of yield plus plus duration. And this has been a call for a while. I'm wondering yeah. how you've reset yeah. your understanding of markets on the heels of the volatility that we've seen, on the prospect of possibly fewer rate hikes yeah. uh, due to financial instability at a time where inflation is still a problem. Yeah, so I think financial stability is the number one priority. So the way that we're resetting, right, it's not it's not full employment, it's not price stability, it's it's financial stability for for. For, for policymakers. And I think if financial stability were to unravel, Lisa, inflation would kind of take care of itself. But at the same time, at the same time, that's not, it's too premature to think that. It's only been a couple of days. The way that we're resetting is, A, we're not overweight equity. Okay, that's first. Second, we had an overweight two duration, so we were more interest rate sensitive than than our benchmark when the 10-year notes hit 4%. That seems like a long time ago, but now, you know, we've we've moved about 50, 60 basis points lower. That's what we've done. We're not we're not we're underweight the US. We're underweight the U.S. dollar versus currencies like the euro and the yen, I think that makes some sense in this environment. Because again, if you remove all of those rate hikes and you have an environment where the European Central Bank, if this is a U.S. issue, continues to move, that creates a really good environment for the euro versus the, the dollar. And repatriation into places like the yen at the end of their you know, calendar year makes some sense. So you put that all together and it's a pretty defensive portfolio but not in a way where we're terribly underweight equity, Lisa. I just want to make that clear. We have a preference for non-U.S. equity over the U.S., but we're pretty much neutral our benchmark on equity. And I think the duration and dollar story really are go hand in hand. Everything this morning over the last week looks very challenged mm -hmm. over the last few days. Phil Camparotti there of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Phil, always great to catch up. Great. Thank you, mate. A TK, just unbelievable that we had two days of testimony. I keep saying, yeah, bank failed in 24 hours. I know we're all using that language. These things don't happen in a single day. 
There is something that leads up to it. And it's un unbelievable for me that the Fed chair was able well, to sit there for two days and have no idea that a bank in America was about to collapse. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You have to measure the trust and the confidence. French Hill, I believe, is scheduled to join us. He actually ran a bank at one point. That That'll conversation coming up. So far, it's pretty calm. Mm -hmm. um, we even saw material good inflows yesterday still. Um, also, you know, I had a client meeting which was very positive on that one. So, so far it's calm, but I think it's early days. It's early days. That was the Credit Suisse CEO. The stock is down by 3.4%, just off session lows. 2.18, lower the session, record low. 2.12 on Credit Suisse stock. They are seeing material good inflows yesterday. I think we'll have to get some more detail on that in the coming weeks. The next earnings report comes from Credit Suisse in about a month from now. They say that we should see some progress in Q1. We'll get that Q1 report on April 27th. And as we've said repeatedly, April feels like a very, very long way away in a market moving as quickly as it's moving. Tom, I know you're focused on First Republic as well. That stock is up nicely. Just as it's one bounce. indicator, yeah. It's another lift. Yeah. Near session highs up 32%, TK. Nice, 31 up to 38-ish, maybe 37, I should say. And then a nice spike up here as we open up for a Tuesday morning. 41 is the last uh, on FRC. Because of time, we're just going to run right to it. David George is Senior Research Analyst at Baird very importantly, with decades of experience. David, what are you writing this morning? Let me just cut to the chase. What matters right now for David George? Um, we wrote this morning, uh, Tom, good morning. Thanks for, for having me. We, we believe that this is an asymmetrically positive risk reward for regional bank stocks. In fact, probably the most constructive that we've been since covid maybe even more constructive than that. This is uh, one of the best setups that we have seen in the last 20, I've done this 23 years, and this right. is a, a, an unbelievably good risk-reward setup uh, for right. the stock. What is the skill set to determine that a given bank is not seeing outflows and that that given bank has trust and confidence? Um, well, you know, part of it is, obviously, we, we, it's, it's difficult to predict customer behavior. Um, but I think so something that has gone un undiscussed in the financial media is, and I don't cover Silicon Valley, but I think it's important to note that they have $220 billion in deposits. Do you know how many branches they had? 18. Do you know how many branches U.S. Bank has? 5,000. The average deposits per branch at most U.S. banks is about 15 to $50 million, not $2 billion per office. So, the granularity of most U.S. regional banks' funding is, is just infinitely different than the kind of banks that have been reported um, that have failed. So uh, obviously we are in a period where investors have long memories and there's panic, but that is where you get these asymmetric opportunities, and that's where we are, in my opinion. That said, David, there's a very different scenario that is uniform pretty much across all the banking sector as well as uh, beyond, which is the immediacy of being able to withdraw in real time, online, uh, at any time, the ability for there to be a bank run that happens so quickly that even regulators are caught completely off guard. How does that change your risk assessment of smaller banks, especially at a time where cash is paying something and a lot of people are concerned that these banks are not going to be able to deliver? Well, first of all, I'm not concerned. Maybe that doesn't matter. But the, to your second point, Lisa, the, the movement of funds into treasuries and higher yielding alternatives, that, that, that's been going on for over a year. So that is not a new phenomenon. Now, how people feel about that, given where the stocks have been trading, is new. But fundamentally, that has been happening for, for several months and several quarters. In terms of the movement of deposits and things like social media and media like yourselves talking about bank runs, that's really not that helpful, to be honest, um, to depositors, because most customers of regional banks do not have millions of dollars. They've got maybe $5,000 in a checking account. Maybe a small business has got 100000 They are not focused on this. They are focused on running their businesses. So I, I just think that the, the, the similarities between Silicon Valley and most other what I would call Main Street banks couldn't be more different. 
That said, there is this concern about the interest rate risk at a lot of banks, and I am wondering from your perspective, putting aside, you know, what the media's role is or what investors' role is or what the reputational risk is, what about the nuts and bolts, potential unrealized losses on the balance sheets of a number of regional <coughs> banks that haven't necessarily hedged against a dramatic in, uh, rise in interest rates and among all of their assets they used to back those customer deposits? Um, well, a couple things. So banks, as part of the Dodd-Frank legislation, have to own securities as part of what's called the LCR, liquidity coverage ratios. And keep in mind, Silicon Valley and banks under $250 billion in assets are no longer subject to that legislation. All of the big banks that we talk about are all subject to that, by the way. That's another thing that has gone unreported and unnoticed and undiscussed. Um, in terms of the interest rate risk, yes, there are banks that are sitting on <laughs> securities these are money good securities, by the way. These are treasuries and MBS that pay as agreed. These are not subprime loans. These are not CDOs. These are money good securities. And by the way, deposits have value as well. They are not marked to market either. So despite that, you, you have banks that are generating JP Morgan, what did they make last quarter? Eight billion of earnings. B of A made five billion of earnings. This is just not a crisis. 2008 was a crisis. This is a very short-term crisis of confidence driven by one bank that was essentially a levered PE fund. So um, from my perspective, there are obviously unrealized losses. And by the way, with bonds rallying, those losses are now becoming gains, and that will change over time. Uh, but, and my, most banks will hold these, these securities until maturity. Um, yeah. But I think, just, I think just to say that these banks aren't managing interest rate risk, I, I think is is not an intellectually honest statement from my perspective. Well, David, it's always fantastic to get your perspective. Repeatedly through this conversation, you do sound somewhat frustrated with the way this story has been covered over the last three <laughs> days. What would you like to see hear more of going forward? What are the questions that you think have been missing? Um, I, I just think that, that the constant focus on <clears throat> is your money safe, it, it, it just... And, and I think the proliferation of social media is obviously something that I know you, you're not necessarily engaged in. But but I think it's just no, important to. I think <laughs> I think it's important to to just distinguish between banks and their funding and their customer bases. And um, you know I, th th this particular situation is frustrating when you've got a not to get political, but when you've got a VC legend tells everyone that screams fire in a. <laughs> in a crowded theater, that's not helpful um, either. And that, that's a whole nother discussion. But I think, I think the main thing is just having some differentiation between banks. And, and by the way, there will be beneficiaries of this. All of the large banks, as you kind of referenced a little bit earlier before we started the show, um, they will benefit from this. So there will be your, your big 10 to 15 banks yeah. will be net beneficiaries, which, which is something that, again, I think not, has not been discussed. And, and those stocks have gotten smoked as well. It's something we talked about a lot over the last three days. A lot of money is going to go to the SIBs. There's going to be a premium attached to them just in terms of safety, perceived safety. David, this was great. Let's try and make this regular because I have no doubt there's going to be a story. Uh, for the next couple of weeks, maybe even the next couple of months. David George there of Bad TK, your thoughts? Yeah, well, David George was at A.G. Edwards, which is a huge part of the fabric of the Midwest out of St. Louis years ago. I've got a nodding acquaintance with the venerable firm. And the answer is, is he's somebody knee-deep in will they roll up, will they consolidate, will they out of this crisis, will the strong find the weaker? I'd like to say that David George moved FRC three points, <laughs> but unfortunately I don't think it was Mr. George, folks. It was probably Mr. Schwartz. Sportsman who did that. What do you make no. of that Blackstone headline, Tom? <clears throat> INSVB it's, assets. This is the way it is. And, and David, before we saw that headline, alluded to it. There was crisis. I don't have an, well, I do have an opinion, but I'm not going to give it on Silicon Valley Bank and what they were doing, the behavior, et cetera. It's, you know, we all can have our opinion on that. The fact is, it's Tuesday, it's not Friday. And on Tuesday, you begin to do a workout of a blown up bank. That's what we see when we see a Blackstone headline saying SVB assets uh, as they I, I didn't write this as soon as Circle Bank. They're circling the bank. I think David made a good That's point Westerns, though. Over, over the weekend John there was some Wayne thanks for that. Movies, thank you. Some really Westerns, irresponsible comments. Gary Cooper. Over the weekend. 
we're going to keep having two different <coughs> conversations. Yes. I'm listening. Oh, sounds normal. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Anytime. You're talking <clears throat> about some of the uh, the uh, venture capitalists who came out and raised yeah. some issues. Just, you know, and, yeah, kind of pushed on I it. actually think those are the kind of voices that make it difficult for the policymaker to actually come and do the things they're saying you should do because it sounds like you're doing them for them. Which is the reason why Gary Gensler saying he's going to investigate some of this for potential yeah. securities issues is going to be interesting. If they can get some more kind of reconstruction of what happened. Equities right now up eight tenths of one percent. There we go. That's a turnaround in the last ten minutes or so. <laughs> Equities on the S and P firmer. Close to session highs, actually, up by three quarters of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, up seven tenths of 1% on a Russell heavily weighted to the financials, the banks, the Russell 2000 up by about 1%. One name Lisa will talk about in a moment, but First Republic followed a lot at the moment, of course, for obvious reasons. The stock's up big time in the pre-market. We'll pick up on that in a moment. In the bond market, two-year yields down big time in the last three days. A 100 basis point move. On a two-year, in three sessions, literally we have not seen moves like this since the 80s. I don't think we've ever seen a reassessment of Fed policy in a single day like we did just yesterday <coughs> to price out all those rate hikes, basically start pricing in a pause and price in a bunch of cuts. So I think we had a peak rate priced in at the Federal Reserve last week of something like 560 and now what's the peak right now, Lisa? 490? Yeah, I mean, Something it's 480. Like yeah. I mean, it's just been going down. It's just it's, shocking, the repricing. It's unbelievable. Your 10-year right now is higher by two basis points, 359. Your two-year up 24, 422. And just to finish on foreign exchange, I keep forgetting this. I keep reminding myself. The ECB has got a meeting on Thursday. I honestly <clears> don't know what they're going to do. They essentially, through all their communication since the last meeting, pre-committed to 50. I they were just strongly leaning in that direction. Everything's gone quiet. Things have got messy. Do they back away, Tom? Do it they back a, away? It is a different cultural uh, force than the Fed. And I think here with the inflation rates that we've reported and discussed in Europe, I'm going to say this. It's different. And it'll be fascinating to see how the core of Europe adapts and adjusts to crisis but also to the sustained level of inflation. It's not the same as the United States. Because yesterday, Tom, we didn't just reprice the Federal Reserve, <clears throat> Lisa. We also repriced the ECB in a major way as well. And I don't understand how they respond to this, because is this somehow disinflationary for them, too, if there's a financial system crisis? <clears throat> well, yeah, if it's a financial system crisis, but is there? And that really uh, brings us to what we want to take a look at today. You mentioned First Republic Bank. Let's take a look at those shares. Yesterday, they were down more Boom than 60 percent. Today, they are up by more than 50 percent. How much is this due to some of the sales that we've seen of the assets that we've seen announced, whether it's Apollo or Blackstone? How much is it because people are reassessing the backstop and realizing perhaps they got oversold? But to see that kind of pop shows you where we are. Comerica shares, which were also down heavily yesterday, up more than 14 <coughs> percent. Western Alliance shares up more than 35 percent. If you look at PacWest, those shares up almost 39 percent. I mean, the bounce back has been tremendous at a time, uh, John, where we're looking at potential stability. So now what does that mean for Fed policy? Well, we've constantly got to remember where we've been also. Correct. We opened last week, I think, at 123 on First Republic. <coughs> right now, just south of, just north of 46. Right. So how much is this bottom feeders? How much is this people saying Don't that, know. you know, these are really cheap and you see that uh, coming out from a whole host of investors trying to say that? I don't know. I don't know what the signal and the noise is here, whether this is stability or just more ongoing volatility as people try to parse through where we are. Where is the Fed next week? We'll get a clue on that in about 60 minutes. And I'll go back to what I said yesterday. We said repeatedly, the next Fed position, the next Fed moves at the mercy of payrolls and CPI. It got 311, was it, on payrolls? Yeah. And we'll get CPI, Tom, in 57 minutes. Now, certainly a constructive day today, and FRC is the best news out there for Jerome Powell at right now. This is a joy, and what we want to do, and really this is with the leadership of Bloomberg Technology, please see what Caroline and Ed are, are, are doing there, is we want to talk to people that actually do innovation, actually do technology. Jay Doss is Brown Engineering out of Booth School, Chicago. He's a guy that's put all sorts of transactions together for his. Sapphire Ventures. We're thrilled he could join us in his early uh, morning. Jay, I want to cut to the chase right now. In 2017, you unloaded on Mark Benioff MuleSoft. Could you do that today? Can you get transactions done after this crisis? 
Uh, thanks for having me. Um, you know, uh, Sapphire is a growth stage firm uh, that invests in uh, companies uh, that we think are building companies of consequence. Yeah, to answer your question, I don't think we can unload uh, any company like Mulesoft to Salesforce or to any company. Now, although we do have a transaction going on to a, to a large uh, corporation in the moment, and that hasn't stopped, right? Uh, so I don't think that people who are looking to acquire companies have actually slowed down because of this uh, crisis with SVB. You studied under Randall Krosner, no doubt, at Booth, and maybe even Austin Goolsby, and they'll tell you in crisis, debt becomes more costlier. You've pointed that out in your note this morning at the summary that the, the, the debris of Silicon Valley is there's going to be a new cost to technology and innovation. How large will that burden be? Yeah, that is going to be a huge burden. So there are two different things here, right? The, the large corporations and the PE firms who are actually looking to acquire companies, for them, they don't have a debt burden, right? They have lots of capital available, and, you know, they can just buy it for cash, which is what is happening with one of our portfolio companies. It is really the small startups and the startups which haven't made it, which actually depend on venture debt from companies like, you know, SVB and, uh, and Comerica and, and other folks who are going to have a huge issue because the cost of capital has gone up. Right with SVB, you could get venture debt, you know, for a company that didn't have uh, a lot of revenues, but was backed by an investors and you know by large equity, and SVB would lend against that. And those kind of debt instruments are probably gone for for now. Are you providing capital yourself, Sapphire Ventures, to your portfolio companies to try to bridge the the gap in order to avoid some of those high interest loans? Yes. Uh, so for the first thing that we had to do over the weekend was really figure out how to make trade offs right? And just like a lot of other investment firms, we actually put together a deadline. We were actually, some of our CEOs were going to fund payroll personally, and some of the partners in funds were also going to fund the payroll personally so that, you know, the employees of these startups didn't have to, you know, go without their pay on, on Wednesday. But thankfully, that did not happen. But now what is going to happen after all of this is that you know, people are still worried about the, the cost of debt, you know, how more equity rounds are going to happen. So, yes, yeah, so we have been sharpening our pencils and looking at all the portfolio companies that might need some more equity funding, you know, in the next six to 12 months. Jay, you said that deals are still getting done at a, at a pretty rapid pace, that there still is lots of interest. I'm curious, especially as, as a lot of people say, tighter financial conditions, tighter monetary conditions creates more innovation and more stabi uh, stable businesses. But at what cost? How much do you see valuations coming down in order to get some of these transactions done? Yeah, I, I think the valuations are all driven by the public markets, right? And, you know, it's kind of interesting. The tech stocks actually went up when you know all the crisis happened with SVB. So I think uh, the people who are acquiring, the strategics who are acquiring, they are you know taking a long-term view of what they can do with the assets they buy. But definitely the PE firms, they are much more driven by you know the multiples, <clears throat> and uh, you know so they are definitely looking right. to pay a less amount of you know in 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 terms of you know valuation. Jay, I get the idea that there are banks, entrepreneurial, flexible. Maybe they've got a better relationship over a latte in Silicon Valley is the stereotype. Why can't the big banks do this? Why can't Sapphire and others, including startups, deal with Wells Fargo or J.P. Morgan or the others? Yes. Uh, look, I think it was a matter of trust, right? Because a lot of the times when Silicon Valley Bank did some of their deals, you know, there we they backed companies in with VCs who they have worked with before. And if the company got into trouble, you know, they had the trust that the VCs would come and figure out a way to make that work and make sure that the debt got repaid. That doesn't happen when you have a big bank and you don't have that trust and that relationship. You know, you might have, have managers, the debt managers who are not the same over multiple transactions. But this is a matter of trust, right? Because that was the whole thing that is missing when you deal with large banks where, you know, they are looking at numbers and you can't call up somebody and say, hey, look, uh, they are kind of missing their covenant for, for a couple of months and we are going to put in more equity to make them over the covenant. But, you know, give us those two months. You know, those kind of discussions doesn't happen with big provide, debt providers. 
Jay, just real quick here, I wanted to follow up on something that you said, where you think that the private markets and venture capital follows the public markets. We saw a 20 percent decline last year in public markets. They've been whipsawing all over the place. From your vantage point, how much of the decline has already been realized in venture capital and how much more is there to go? I think there is still a lot of pain in terms of valuation to go, right? I think, that, you know, as you saw, the the later stage deals have started to happen a little bit. There are some acquisitions that are that are happening, but they are being done at a much lower multiple. I think there is a lot of companies that have raised capital at really high valuation, and you know that they haven't gone to the point where they need to raise another round of equity. And those are the companies I think in the next 12 months will probably you know either uh, have more equity placed into them with some structure to keep the valuation or the smarter entrepreneurs will actually, you know, take equity at a lower valuation, which actually makes a lot more sense. Jay, I just want to go full circle on a couple of things, if that's okay. I've got about two minutes left with you. Yeah. Jay, when this was unfolding last week and you had portfolio companies in SVB, what were you telling them to do? Well, first and foremost, we were telling them, you know, to figure out how much assets they had in SVB. Versus, because, you know, I think about a third of our companies had all their assets in SVB and some of the other folks had some assets in SVB and, and you know, in other banks. So the first thing, of course, was payroll, right? Like all of Friday and Saturday, that's all we worked on to figure out how we can make payroll. And, and then, you know, the, the second question that we, everybody had to look, look at was, okay, which bank should they go and open their accounts, right, to have the second account that didn't have an account outside of SVB. Yeah. But, you know, it was all talk about short term, not about long term. Jay, did you feel like in any way that you were part of its collapse? No, I, I don't think we were part of the collapse. I, I just think that everybody was caught by surprise, uh, you know, by this, this could unfold so quickly. And when you look at their balance sheet, yes, people don't pay attention to the balance sheet, you know, and the way they structured their, their, you know, the way they invested in treasury bonds, you know, I think if you, if you are an economic student, you would absolutely make sense. But I don't think anybody was paying attention, you know, to, to their balance sheet. I just think there's one theory that's doing the rounds, and I don't necessarily subscribe to it. I just want you to respond to it if possible. That VC and your portfolio companies, just as a universe, blew up the bank that served you by all heading to the exit and telling portfolio companies to do the same thing. And then the authorities stepped in on Sunday and basically all made you whole. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody did this uh, together as a VC blew up the bank, because I think if you look at it, we'll have to pay a lot for not only working through the weekend and making sure the payroll is done, but the cost of capital has gone up. If this SVB is gone, as I said, venture debt is not available. Uh, you know, it's going to be much more expensive. So I think people knew the ramifications, and I don't think it was a you know coordinated effort to blow up SVB. You know, I think it was just like anybody else. Somebody on Twitter or, or heard from their friend that hey, maybe they are insolvent. Maybe you should move the money. And, you know, and just like anything else, it's a psychological thing, yeah. right? Uh, as we heard in behavioral economics, right? The bank run is not coordinated. It just happens because. One, somebody says, hey, we moved our money, and then everybody else started doing the same thing. It's a classic bank run, exactly that. Jay, yeah. thanks for your perspective. Appreciate it. Thank you. Jay Das there of Sapphire Ventures. Equity futures near session highs up three quarters of 1%. Vince Reinhardt coming up. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Germany's largest munitions manufacturer says Europe's defense industry can't meet Ukraine's artillery ammunition needs unless governments increase spending to double production capacity. Ryan Mattal AG says it's producing at just two-thirds capacity due to lagging orders. Ukrainian and European officials have warned repeatedly that sufficient supply of artillery munitions will prove a decisive factor in the ongoing war. Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida and likely Republican presidential candidate, expressed strong misgivings over U.S. support for Ukraine in its defense against Russia's invasion, breaking not only with the Biden administration, but other prominent Republicans. DeSantis said in a statement that protecting the U.S. southern border, confronting China, and bolstering the American military should take priority. President Biden has authorized a giant ConocoPhillips oil project in Alaska despite opposition from environmentalists. The approach represents a middle ground for the president as he seeks to transition from fossil fuels while still being bound by the decisions of past administrations. The project was already approved once under former President Donald Trump. 
Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Eighty percent of what happened after May 2020 was a mistake. You know, we, we had a real crisis in May, in May 2020, and thank God they stepped in and did something really radical. And, you know, the second and third waves of PPP being indiscriminate was a mistake. Sending checks to everybody was a mistake. Taking interest rates to where they were and then keeping their, them for that long, it was all a mistake. Yeah. Except, of course, if you received those checks, and if you received those checks, they felt pretty good. That was Michael Schau there, Market Field Asset Management he was CEO. Fabulous. He was brilliant yesterday. That full interview on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal, if you want to take a look. Let's take a look at markets <coughs> right now on the S&P. Good morning to you. Up eight-tenths of 1%. It's a better market so far. Heavily dependent, of course, on what we may or may not get in 43 minutes' time. The CPI report just around a corner. Yields are up four basis points on a 10-year. That looks like a normal day, doesn't it? Up four basis points on a 10-year. I'll show you an abnormal day. <laughs> just look at the two-year over the last three, four sessions. It's up 24 basis points this morning. Two years, 4.21. Tom, <coughs> last Wednesday, North the five yesterday at the close south of four yeah i don't know brent crude can't get above 80 this morning which really has my attention it's tangential i get it's tertiary if you will but also we've got to look at these stocks john we've had a nice lift in the troubled agony of yesterday and a friday and FRC so first republic's a name we keep going back to that stock is up in a pre-market by 44%. Credit Suisse in the last 10 Credit minutes, Suisse recovering. a little bit more. Yeah, bit still more. down by 1.3%, but certainly recovering. The low was 212 right now. Let's call it 223 <clears> and be kind. We'll have to see. Right now, because of time and, and to dash into the inflation report in 45 minutes, we're going to pretend there's not a financial crisis. I'm going to ask one selected question here on the history of economics, and John and Lisa will dive into this CPI report. He is Vincent Reinhardt. He is chief economist at Dreyfus and Mellon. Far more, he led research at the Federal Reserve System under Alan Greenspan and was considered definitive in herding PhD cats there over wonderful, wonderful uh, research. Vincent, I, I would love to talk to Chairman Greenspan about this this morning, and I'm going to use you as a respected proxy. Were we unmeasured? Did we get out in front of our skis, as the cliche is? I look at the first derivative of this rate rise, and I've never seen a steepness and abruptness on a log axis like we've seen this time around. In hindsight, would you suggest we lost our Greenspanian way and we were unmeasured? So Alan Greenspan always talked about letting the air out of the balloon slowly. Uh, I would go back to the transcripts in 1994 when FOMC <clears throat> participants were just banging on the table about how inflation had gotten out of control. It was important to contain inflation expectations. Sound familiar in any way? And, uh, and Greenspan just kept saying 25 basis points. Back then, by the way, he was disrespectfully referred to as quarter point Al. Uh, and it was with some reluctance that he picked up the pace of tightening. Uh, and then it read, it, they lost control of the narrative. It, there was at one Did point, Jerome Powell lose control of this narrative? Uh, I think that uh, he's done a pretty good job at explaining why they're doing it. And look, if you, you had a 1970s, early 1980s problem, this, this was, was serious, and he expressed it with, with you know, considerable uh, 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 vigor. I think that uh, there are some questions about when they stepped up from 50 to 75. I still have the scars of June 13th uh, when they basically made a pivot uh, in the blackout period. Uh, I think there's a question of stepping down from 50 to 25. Um, but let's face it. If you raise the federal funds rate up one percentage point in under a year, you are going to break some crockery. 
Uh, and in some sense, the surprising thing, if this is not the first time you heard it, yeah. how come there isn't more restraint on aggregate yeah, Crocker is a British face, in case yeah, you... Yeah, I'm aware. I did it for John. Thank you. I appreciate that, Vince. Yeah. Uh, actually, I did a meeting where I said, you're going to break some China, and the, and the client response was, but China's been doing fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Vince, we have broken some things. We've got some bank failures, and of course, I won't ask you to comment specifically on the nature of the bank failures or on the names themselves. Can you tell me how you think, given what we've learned through history, how this Federal Reserve will confront a bank failure when it sets monetary policy next week? Because you mentioned they've got a 70s, 80s inflation problem. Do they still have a 70s, 80s inflation problem? Uh, first, working backwards, they made some progress. Uh, we're talking about something that is much more contained, and progress has its own risk in terms of the dialogue within the committee. Uh, it's going to be less pressing a problem for some of the FOMC participants. Uh, second thing, let's go back and who are the Nobel laureates right now? Uh, Diamond Divvig and Bernanke. Diamond Divvig set up what it takes to have a self-fulfilling run on a financial institution. Um, boy, I could t you could teach that class out of out of yeah, out Justin Wolfer said the fourth, same thing at Michigan. Uh, uh, fourth quarter call report, and then Bernanke said that if that 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 cascading failures can cramp economic activity. That's about what uh, the triumvirate of regulators did over the weekend. Uh, the key issue is the separation principle, which is the view that if you do bank supervision and regulation correctly, then you have a free hand on monetary policy. There's also a dark side to the separation principle, and that is if you decide to deflect the course of your monetary policy, given what you think the aggregate economy is doing, then you're basically admitting you didn't get it right well, on supervision and crisis management. Which is uh, the subject of an investigation right now, I believe, at the Federal Reserve in terms of why they didn't see a bigger problem yeah. here to begin with. There is this issue, though. If they did come up with this program to stave off some of the systemic risks stemming from SVB, then is there a greater risk, in your view, that inflation will get out of control, that they will compromise their inflation fighting for a problem that has already been solved and will not have the same disinflationary force? So I will admit that looking at the call report for SVB brought back terrible memories of the first facts that came through on long-term capital management's balance sheet. Uh, and what was interesting about that was both were actually in the public domain. LTCM was reporting to the CFTC. Uh, so there's a bit of similarity in that regard. Uh, and then the question is, in retrospect, do we think it was appropriate to ease then and keep the funds rate low even as the economy seemed to weather the blow? If you did crisis management right, you should have a free hand in monetary policy. This is a psychological question now. Yeah. I think it's actually really important. They're going to sit around the table as a committee and basically they have to decide whether if they stop hiking, does it undermine the policy they announced Sunday evening? Is that essentially what you're saying? That, that's a risk associated with it. I'd say two things about that. First sure. is earlier on you were welcoming Lel Brainerd at the White House. Yeah. I was lamenting that the most effective force for policy moderation wasn't <laughs> going to be on the FOMC table. And that actually matters. True. Because, you know, the people talking about 50 well, you know, were the ones who okay. were probably least this, concerned this is, about This is it. crucial. Does the president have to step in? and say, we're in a crisis, and I would like the vice chairman to stay at the Fed. Nope. That's too late. That's terrible. That, 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 that train already left the oh, station. Come on. We're in crisis. It, you know, she won't be in, you know. Uh, and then that's saying you have uh, second doubts about the independence of your central bank. I do okay there? You did fantastic. I'm trying not to get in trouble. I uh. asked this question of Anne-Marie <clears throat> last week, though, and Vince, maybe we can leave it there. It's a difficult one to answer. I acknowledge that. So if you don't want to go there, don't. I'll go there for you. I asked Anne-Marie whether this, this administration isn't really thinking too much about the importance of the Federal Reserve to take away the vice chair at the time they took away the vice chair. I don't think it's particularly unique among administrations not to play the chessboard too many steps forward. Uh, and I think it's a, 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 um, a reflection of uh, a, a surplus. Uh, the, the natural tendency would to say is the bench depth of good economists who could step in is pretty, pretty, 
pretty uh, uh, deep. Yeah. And therefore, let's f fix our one problem and then go on to the next problem. What that neglects is the culture, the institution that people just don't, the, the Senate doesn't act all that fast and it takes a while to, to, to fit in. So that, that's, that's an issue. What a tricky moment. Vince, thanks for setting this up. Okay. It's such a tricky moment for this Federal Reserve next week. Vincent Reinhardt of Dreyfus and Mellon. From New York City, equity futures up 8 tenths of 1%. Sam Stovall, CFRA, coming up. As soon as there's a problem with one bank, Fear is real. There's a purposeful effort right now to drain liquidity and drain those deposits. At the end of the day, the Fed has to keep inflation under control. That's the main focus here. I think that the Fed is just going to be winging it, which is really what they've been doing all along, right? I think it's very soon to make a call on the Fed being done. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlett, and Tom Keen. 30 minutes from an inflation report was hugely anticipated and tick by tick still anticipated as we look to this financial crisis. What you need to know right now quickly, shares do better. And someone noticing the debris from Silicon Valley, John, is the senator from Massachusetts. I should say in advance that Elizabeth Warren's wheelhouse is bankruptcy. This is her territory. Uh, Wheelhouse is also beating up on Chairman Powell, <coughs> just for the true. record. So let's squeeze that in there. Here's the quote from the senator from Massachusetts. Fed chair Powell's actions to allow big banks like Silicon Valley Bank to boost their profits by loading up on risk directly contributed to these bank failures. For the Fed's inquiry to have credibility, there will be one. Powell must publicly and immediately recuse himself from this internal review. It's appropriate for Vice Chair for Supervision, Barr, to have the independence necessary to do his job. Now, is this just an opportunistic mm -hmm. moment for the senator from Massachusetts to take another dig at Chairman Powell, or does she have a point? It's the structure of the two banks that you and I talked about the other day, and we just spoke to Vincent Reinhardt on, who's truly expert. Vincent Reinhardt said, don't shake the ship right now, and certainly a Powell recuse would shake the ship. But this is the partition of Brainerd leaving on monetary policy versus Michael Barr on the financial side, the bank side. And, and I'm going to let be clear, Republican or Democrat, Senator Warren speaks with some authority here. This is her academic purview. It's certainly embarrassing for the Fed chair to be on Capitol Hill doing a testimony on monetary policy 24 hours, 48 hours before a bank collapses in America, talking about increasing <clears throat> the pace of rate increases and without any real idea, seemingly. On the surface, I don't know what he actually knew, but on the surface, yeah. it didn't seem like he knew that any of this was going to play out. I will say this, Tom, just on regulation. Back in 2018, a lot of people have talked about the former administration pushing the deregulatory effort. 17 of Senator Warren's Democratic colleagues joined that push as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of soul-searching that needs to take place in Congress down in D.C. Well, on a lot of issues. We've heard that without question, but, Lisa, what this really, really harkens to is the investigative process forward. I mean, we're still not out of this crisis, even with a better stock performance today. And how many hearings, how many studies, how much analysis will there be? Well, as we look backward, it's also important to look forward. And Vincent Reinhardt was kind of brilliant on this, saying that if you manage the financial risk, if you manage any kind of systemic problems in the financial system, then you can let monetary policy have an independent course. Well, that if on the front <coughs> hand was not right. done. And that, to me, really raises a question about the back end. Can they continue to raise rates at a time when people are still worried about financial stability, when you're still dealing with an inflation mm -hmm. crisis, and then suddenly we have a real problem, a crisis in monetary policy and credibility. John, this is the first time in a week I've looked at the ECO screen oh, to look at inflation. Welcome back to the data. So it's 0 0.5% <laughs> <laughs> prior. This is the monthly statistic, as Mike McKee said. It's such a jumble now. Don't look at year over year. And we are looking for some form of disinflation from 0 0.5 down to 0 0.4. They're in my ear. Get back to the crisis. So, so the Mike crisis. McKee <laughs> chops it up in 20 different ways, and I'll let Mike do that in 26 <laughs> minutes. I make it simple. I think for the headlines of the newspapers in this country, the news, your local news, they often go with the headline year over year 
print. So that's going to be potentially around 6%. That's the median estimate. That's down from 6.4. On Wall Street, big focus on the trend month over month core. We'll take month over month core. We're looking for that to come in at 0.4, previously 0.4. What Lisa's talking about is vital. What Vincent Reinhardt said there 15 <coughs> minutes ago, the fact that they also have to confront a psychological question on the FOMC next week. Just in this sense, and Priya Misra of TD touched on this too, and I think it's increasingly important as the days go by. They announced a lot on Sunday evening, and they clearly announced it in a way, Tom, that they thought it was sufficient to really insulate the financial system in America. Yeah. The president came out Monday morning and basically said the same thing. If you've got inflation in around 6%, <clears throat> and as Fed chair, you back away for financial stability concerns, are you undermining what you announced the week previously? Are you basically suggesting that wasn't enough? Now, maybe they think it was enough and they can go on hiking, but ultimately that psychological question will linger, Tom, about what they should do. Back away, uh, go forward. Does the data warrant it? Do financial stability concerns mean they should pull back? They've got to move the assets out. The fundamental thing to me over the weekend is waiting, waiting, waiting to see who would take the misery out of these uh, companies. And the key thing is it didn't happen. Banks did not step up to acquire this. I could suggest it's because they didn't give them a, gr a great enough haircut. It's just as simple as that. But they, they had to get there fast for the president's comments Monday morning, and that's what they did Sunday The other night. one that's to look at, Tom, is in the next <clears> week, I've got no idea what the market does, of course. I've got no idea what the print is in 24 minutes' time. But maybe the market starts doing the work for them. Maybe financial conditions do tighten materially. Maybe bank lending standards lease are tighten aggressively as well given the developments of the last week. Yeah, but you highlight such an important point, which is if they immunize the financial system and they believe that, then why should they compromise monetary policy at a time where small business optimism came in hotter than expected at 6 a.m. Eastern this morning, when we do see upside surprises in the economic <coughs> data and we still are talking about inflation? Again, this is a really difficult moment for them. Perhaps the market will do the work, but will that take care of the inflation that we're dealing with, Tom? Let's go to the price action briefly. We're up three quarters of 1% <coughs> on the S&P 500, slightly elevated, just off session highs. I think there's a couple of names I know you will want to follow. Credit Suisse is one. It's down 1.7%, so that recovers off session lows. Near session highs on First Republic and other small banks as well in the pre-market, Tom. So I think it's doing OK so <coughs> far, about 23 minutes away from that CPI print. Right now is really important, and we really need to be quiet on Global Wall Street and listen. If you're not part of Global Wall Street, this is your conversation of the day. In the last 24 hours, I've heard one, two, three people allude back to 1987. Sam Stovall, in 1987, was in a hospital because his father was having a routine procedure and the 23-year-old or whatever you were, Sam, at the time was bailing out the legendary Robert Stovall by getting trades done. It was strange in 1987. He now joins us, the chief investment strategist at CFRA, not from a hospital uh, bed. Sam Stovall, very simply, are there illusions here to 1987 where your father was courageous? Hello there, Tom. Uh, well, I'm amazed. How'd you get all that information? Was that chat GDP? To, you know, chat GPT. Uh... John said to me, check chat GPT. <laughs> yes. Well, I think we are seeing some comparisons, certainly uh, with the bond uh, market, uh, the decline that we've been seeing in yields today as compared with how sharply they fell back in 1987. And the question being, has the Fed gone too far? Uh, so, also, the question is, will this be throwing us further uh, into recession or the risk of recession? Uh, and what's going to happen with the Fed? I think that the Fed will need to maintain credibility, will need to save face, but at the same time, dial back their hawkishness uh, to account for the concern that we're facing right now. So it sounds like, Sam, you're in the camp where they raise 25 basis points more and then hold. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely, Lisa. I, I think the feeling is that because inflation is likely to come in uh, CPI at about 6%, uh, another stair step downward, core rate also coming in on that year over year level that I'm not supposed to be talking about. Uh, again, you know, a, a positive indication. Uh, retail sales also expected to come in at 0 0.3, not the 3.0 from last month. Inflation still is a concern, but they have to address the current uh, environment. 
and a lot of people are saying this is one reason to get a little bit more bullish on a soft landing narrative. I mean, I'm hearing a lot about this idea that if the Fed doesn't go as far, perhaps it will do less pain to the overall economy. Do you fall in that camp or do you get more risk averse that right now this potential pause, this potential retracement and hawkishness could indicate greater weakness than people previously realized? Well, I think that we are seeing some uh, um, <laughs> movement away from mid and small cap stocks. I think the implication is that banks are going to be a bit more reluctant uh, to be lending to riskier clients. Uh, that itself could have an impact on slowing economic growth in the U.S. Uh, our economists are not calling for a recession, but history overwhelmingly says that we are headed for a recession. So I take the difference of the two and say it's likely to be fairly mild. Uh, when the Fed does pause. Uh, history says that they start to cut rates nine months later and that the S&P is up 13 percent, led by the financials up on average more than 22 percent. So I would tend to say that if the Fed pauses and stays paused, uh, then I think investors are going to uh, start moving back into equities. Sam, I need to get to a couple of headlines. So we mentioned these headlines from Senator Warren. She's put out a statement. She's put out a tweet as well. <laughs> Fed Chair Powell's actions directly contributed to these bank failures. I'd love for her to elaborate on that. And I'm sure many of you think that excuses what people think is otherwise a poorly ran institution. Vice Chair of Supervision, Barr, at the Federal Reserve, she says it's appropriate for the Vice Chair to have the independence necessary to do his job. Well, I imagine Senator Warren won't like what she's hearing once she sees what he's just said. Barr says... Tom ultimately calls for more banking regulations, yeah. not the answer. Yeah, this is different. There's many bars out there, John. There's Michael Barr, of course. Of, uh, oh, it's Andy Barr. Forgive uh, me, Tom. You know, this, I've made this mistake three or four times. I mean, you know, I did it at a bar as I got confused on bars. But there's Michael Barr, Bloomberg Sports. There is the vice chairman. And then there's Andy Barr that's going to take a Republican uh, tone here. There's, he does that over with Maria right now. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the idea that you're going to see the Republicans pushing back here as they did. And there is a immediate, John, and raging debate over how the Republicans, in which part of the Republicans, how they'll respond to this crisis. Tom, thank you for the correction. That's really important. That was the Republican representative, Andy Barr, not the vice chair of supervision. Thanks for that, TK. It's really important. I believe we've got to leave that interview there as well because the music's started, apparently. So thanks for that, too. Coming up, we're going to catch up with a Republican, French Hill. Looking forward to that different conversation in just a moment. Very different, TK. That conversation coming up shortly. Futures positive. This is Bloomberg. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo chinese president xi jinping and ukraine's Volodymyr zelensky are said to be planning a video call in what would be their first conversation since russia's invasion the wall street journal reported it could come after xi visits moscow a trip which may happen next week president biden meanwhile says he expects to speak with china's leaders soon once the government in beijing returns to work following the national people's congress Credit Suisse CEO Ulrich Korner says the bank had seen inflows of client funds on Monday after markets and U.S. banks were pummeled by the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. So far, it's pretty calm. Um, we even saw material good inflows yesterday still. Um, also, you know, I had a client meeting which was very positive on that one. So, so far, it's calm, but I think it's early days to, to look at it. Korner spoke exclusively with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix. The U.S. system of federal home loan banks is ramping up the amount of cash it has available to deploy as a failure of several U.S. lenders sparks expectations that more regional lenders will need it to tap it for funds. The FHLB system, a key source of cash for regional lenders, raised $88.7 billion through the sale of short-term notes, exceeding the $64 billion that was initially planned. And Fannie Mae has postponed the sale of more than $500 million of mortgage-linked bonds sold by Nomura and Morgan Stanley. Bloomberg has learned Fannie Mae alerted investors that the deal, a $542 million credit risk transfer security, would be delayed, citing market conditions. Securities are riskier than regular Fannie Mae mortgage bonds because they're among the first to take losses when homeowners fail to make payments. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
This is not a bailout of government taxpayer dollars. This is simply using fees that are uh, assessed on all banks by the FDIC in such a time they would need them. So that money is there. It's not from the taxpayers. That was Governor Kathy Hochul of New York. From New York, we are about 13, 14 minutes away from CPI in America. Equity futures shaping up as follows. Positive by eight or nine tenths of 1%. Your bond market, 359.22. Yields a bit higher on a 10-year, a whole lot higher on a two-year after being aggressively lower the last couple of days. Two years higher by 26 basis points, TK, 424. Credit Suisse nudging up and getting up in a recovery high. Thank you again to Francine Lacroix for that important interview with their leader in London at Queen Victoria Street. And FRC, John, nudging right up against it. It's pretty good tape right now for some of these stocks. They're doing better. Doing better. I think is the right way of putting it, Tom. Credit Suisse down by 1.4%, and First Republic, a bank we followed very closely the last couple of days with a decent lift as well. We are thrilled to have the former banker of Little Rock with us right now. He is a name that will become very familiar to Americans here in the study of this financial blow-up. He is French Hill, Republican from Arkansas. French Hill, when you were at Vanderbilt, if you went down 40 and north on 265, you ended up where this debate began at the Hermitage, at Andrew Jackson's spectacular home east of Nashville. And that's where this debate started, the raging debate over the Second Bank of the United States. The Republicans are Jacksonian. They're scared stiff of the big money of New York, et cetera, et cetera. And the Democrats of the urban milieu push against that. How is this battle going to play out? Are we still in fear of the Second Bank of the United States? Well, Tom, I love the history lesson, and the Hermitage is a beautiful spot. Andrew <coughs> Jackson was a super controversial uh, president. But today we're faced with a situation where I think after 10 years of easy money and amazing amounts of fiscal <coughs> stimulus, I think some management teams have forgotten their prudential obligations to their depositors and their shareholders. So we have a real laxity in risk management in some of our financial right. institutions. And perhaps we've got laxity in the supervision of those institutions uh, as well, particularly in the case of Silicon Valley. Do we need to treat the banks such as Delphi that you ran in Arkansas? Do we need to treat smaller banks like the bigger banks out of Dodd-Frank? Do we need a one regulatory system? Is that the lesson learned? Well, I think some of the costs of Dodd-Frank uh, on small banks made them less competitive, harder to earn a, a return <coughs> on invested capital there. And that's why Democrats and Republicans came together, uh, as you noted earlier, and Barney Frank uh, supported it to make modifications in Dodd-Frank's uh, regulatory burden on small financial institutions. I don't think that in any way, shape, or form reduced the obligations of the bankers for their risk <coughs> management uh, legal requirements or for the supervisors to do their routine job on a quarterly basis to make sure the system is safe and sound. Congressman, you keep mentioning the, uh, the supervision, and I'm wondering how much you fault Jerome Powell's Federal Reserve for the lack of supervision that you're talking about. Well, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, clearly had risk management problems in their, in their strategy about uh, short-term deposits that were uninsured, invested in long-term treasury and mortgage securities. And the California bank regulators, the state bank regulators, were the principal regulator backed up by the San Francisco Bank of, uh, uh, of the Fed. And so they do have a supervisory obligation. This bank grew very, very fast over the last two years, and that is usually a huge red flag to supervisors. And perhaps they could have uh, intervened and helped the management team steer in a much more safe and sound direction. Do you think that things have stabilized enough that you have confidence, given the inter intelligence that you've received, that the stability in the financial system is sound and that we're unlikely to see something else like this in the near future? Well, you never know what's going to happen in the future, but we do have a safe and sound bank banking system with good capital and good earnings and uh, generally good liquidity planning across the nation. I think that's clear over the past decade. But I think with uh, low interest rates at zero and then a sharp increase in short rates, some management teams are, were uh, not prepared for handling that in the right way. And so we may have bumps in the road as a result of that. And you've certainly seen that in the case of Silicon Valley uh, last week. 
Congressman, you've come on the show before and talked about how inflation is a tax on the poorest <coughs> members of our society, about how when inflation gets this high, it becomes punitive for so many families. How important is it from your vantage point to see the ongoing rate hikes or some sort of continuation in monetary policy, regardless of some of the concerns that we've seen in the financial system? Or do you think that this is the clarion call that perhaps what we've seen is enough? Lisa, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough question. As I've said on your show before, that's the anguish of central banking to try to balance these factors. But look, uh, the, the Fed has a central obligation to all of us and our families of price stability. So they've got to have that as their principal mission, but they'll look at uh, financial fragility as well. Uh, but I think the Fed should stay on track uh, using their best judgment and looking at the data and make sure that they can beat this inflation and get it back down to closer to their uh, target of 2 percent. If we get to some new insurance regime, the belief here, Congressman, is the banks are going to pay for it, not the taxpayer. I get that idea. But is Arvest Bank of Bentonville, Arkansas, are they going to have to pick up the tab for the irresponsible behavior of West Coast technocrats? Yeah, Tom, this is a great question. And, you know, back in 2008 and 2009, we moved to risk-based premiums based on the bank's uh, CAMEL rating, their risk rating by the regulators. That was a step to making sure that people who run a, a – a, poor shop pay a higher deposit insurance premium. Now the question is, should we have some sort of uh, premium on top of this risk-based <clears throat> premium that would cover these sorts of uh, situations where a bank is determined to be, like they did this weekend, systemically important, and yet we're insuring deposits for which no premium was paid. I think this is an important area for policy to consider. We looked at it back in 08 to 10. I think we need to look right. at it again in the face of this new banking system. And Twitter runs, which is what uh, was precipitating right. this collapse last week. Let's meet in the rotunda. What is the common ground, Congressman Hill, of you and Senator Warren? Well, I think both Senator Warren and I want a safe and sound banking system. We want to make sure, for example, in the digital asset space, that the rules of the road are clear and that we don't have this speculation that we've seen in that market and that criminals are prosecuted and fraudsters are prosecuted. But I would say to Senator Warren, look, we have a robust regulatory system with plenty of rules on banks of all sizes. What we need to see is vigorous supervision of those banks by their primary regulators at all stages of the economic cycle. Does that mean, Congressman, walking back some of the deregulation we saw go through in 2018? You know, Jonathan, I don't think so, because it was a very bipartisan, very modest tiering of the regulatory structure that came out of Dodd-Frank. I don't think you can lay uh, that, uh, you can, I don't think you can lay the, the collapse of the, of the banks last week at the foot of 2155. I don't, <clears throat> I just don't think that's uh, relevant. I think what is relevant is risky management practices with or without uh, Dodd-Frank uh, and lack of supervision by the primary regulator. The reason I ask that is because the regulator used the systemic risk exception to make depositors whole. And, Congressman, what we've acknowledged over the weekend is that basically all banks in America carry some degree of systemic risk. So should they all be regulated in the same fashion regardless of size? Well, I think tiering is important, but that gets back to Tom's good question about deposit insurance. Should we have a premium on top of the base, uh, risk-based premium that somehow reflects that systemic risk? Uh, and that would be something that somebody would have to think through analytically about how one would assess that in a fair uh, and balanced way. But that speaks to this question, because you're right, the regulators this weekend determined that Silicon Valley's reach went well beyond uh, its branches in California and New York as it related to the economy. And Congressman, always great to get your perspective. The banking system, Thanks. the politics down in D.C., Congressman French Hill. How there. odd. A politician with actual understands day -day the banking skill. I would say just because, we're just because that about. bill in 2018 was bipartisan doesn't mean it was good. Just to be, just yeah, to well, be that's clear, his opinion. You know, about that. Were we yeah. surprised? Well, there's going to be a debate about that. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to run you through things with Krishna Mamani, Kathy Jones, Eric and Ajarian on banks from UBS. Looking forward to that. Bob Dollar Cross Mark as well. Michael Gapen of Bank of America. Five big five. lineup in the next Great hour. Lineup. CPI coming up next. It's about four minutes away. Mike McKee's going to break down that for you. He's going to jump in a seat in just a moment from New York. This is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg Surveillance on radio and television across this nation, worldwide. Thank you so much for your comments over the last number of days. Lisa has read and looked at every single one of them. Into the inflation report we go. Well, to me, this is really going to be an important moment. If inflation comes in high, unique. what does Jay Powell do <clears throat> after what we've seen in the great reset of rate hike expectations? Ignoring the financial crisis and completely focused on the inflation report. Our Michael McKee. <laughs> well, good morning. It looks like we won't need a potholder, Lisa. We come in for the most part on point four tenths gain in the CPI headline. However, there is a little bit of a worry in a half percent gain for the CPI core on the month. That is more than the four tenths last month and the four tenths that was expected. So a little bit higher in the core. It doesn't really make a difference on a year over year basis. Year over year falls to 5.5 percent. The core does from 5.6. The Headline CPI matches expectations and comes in at 6%, uh, down from 6.4%. So a little progress. We'll have to check and see what that extra tenth comes from in Is the it? core. But it does suggest, without looking at any of this, that maybe we are not seeing the big decline in rents that everybody Are was we looking supposed for. to analyze this with the two years up 32 basis well, points to begin with? This is this is really, <laughs> that's a great point. I'm looking right now at the two-year yield. It's not moving that much. It's not moving. Moving on the news that on the margins, this was a hotter than expected core read, even though otherwise it came in bang in line. You are seeing still the Nasdaq pop even further. I mean, to me, I wonder how much people are looking past this, Mike, and saying this is all irrelevant because financial markets have changed. There has been a tighter condition. So this is all backward looking and doesn't really have an effect. Well, it's, it's kind of funny because uh, two days ago, or let's say Thursday of last week, we would have said a number like this would have the Fed freaking out and that half percent gain in the core would have people saying, oh, they should go 50. And now we're debating whether they're going to go nothing or 25. I think this, it, it, it doesn't really change the trend. Inflation is slowing, but it's not coming down very fast. And the Fed has more work to do. It is shelter, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that really pushed everything up again this month. Uh, right now, we're looking at a uh, Six, eight tenths percent gain tenths. in shelter. So that's up a tenth yeah. from the month before. Now, that's the broader shelter number. I'll get you the breakdown on OER and rent, but that really right. didn't help at all. It looks like also um, we did see a bit of a gain in gasoline, which was expected uh, by 1%. And uh, used cars, which everybody watches, down 2.8%. So that's more than was thought. Can so you use services you make sense and goods now, or do you have to look at this while we uh, grill Ethan Harris? Well, I'm I'm looking to see if we have the update on that yet, and uh, it looks well, like we do. Um, okay. The, good, the, the uh, core uh, X housing is up uh, only is up 6.2%. That looks like it's not changed from okay. the prior month. So we'll let you dive no in. change. Goods uh, inflation drops to just 1%. Okay, so well, that's a, part of a big trend. change there. 7%, yeah. another increase in services inflation, though. We'll have to see there. Mike McKee with that key trend for Chairman Powell and the rest of the Fed. Futures up 30. Uh, the VIX nicely in from that 30 level to 25.55. And those individual stocks we've been following through the morning, I can click here. I believe I can click here, uh, uh, Lisa, and, and, and get on FRC, if I could type correctly. Yeah, you've seen an incredible rebound and throughout the morning. Pack West. Just a re rebound, uh, seeing if we're through 50 here. Well, we'll have to see on that. This is a joy. His name is Ethan Harris. He's an author. He's also head of global research at Bank of America Securities and stopped economics with a prescient book, Ben Bernanke's Fed, a few years ago. In that book, you talked about a theme I just talked to Vincent Reinhardt about, which was the shadow of Alan Greenspan. Are we in this mess, Dr. Harris, because we became unmeasured? Well, I, I think that uh, I don't think Alan Greenspan's legacy is really that strong right now. I think we got into this mess because, like a lot of central banks and a lot of economists, the Fed started to believe that inflation was largely dead and you didn't have to worry about a sloped Phillips curve, to put a technical term on it. And so they adopted a very right. passive monetary policy. Now we're seeing a massive catch-up by the Fed. And of course, financial accidents happen when you're hiking rates mm -hmm. very fast. And so some of this is a legacy of, of the Feds and other central banks starting too slowly 
to deal with inflation. The legacy and reality that I've seen within Brian Moynihan in his modern Bank of America is he's viscerally granular. Brian, more than any other CEO I know, has a granular feel. With all that research on your banking side, do you see a financial integrity to our banking system beneath the mass mm -hmm. of Bank of America? Well, I, I don't want to comment on Bank of America specifically. No, I mean on the but, other banks yeah, and no, the other I think system that, that Moynihan's glued to. And I team. think one of the questions for, for uh, uh, investors these days is how healthy is the banking system? And I think as your previous guest said, the banking system overall is in excellent health. It's heavily regulated, heavily capitalized. Um, you're always going to have, during periods of stress, some events. And I would think of this as you know, a stress event uh, in the context of otherwise not just strong financial uh, banking system, but strong financial system in general. So when you look at the balance of risks right now, and this is something that I've been giving a lot of thought to, if the financial system is strong, you have these supports, you get a better sense of a rebound, it doesn't really tighten financial conditions all that much from where we were. And in fact, given the lower expectations for Fed rate hikes, you have easier financial conditions yes. than you did uh, just a bit ago. At what point does that become a huge risk for inflation that does not come down? Well, I think we need to recognize that we're in the middle of a, of a stress event, and so it's very hard to predict where things are going. Uh, the markets will always price out the central bank during a crisis like this. But the real question is, does the policy uh, efforts, does the attempt to ring fence the problem, does it work? If it works, the Fed then goes back to their regularly scheduled program, and they have to deal with inflation. If it doesn't work, then monetary policy gets drawn into the process of supporting uh, the financial system. Our view is that ultimately the ring fencing works and the Fed goes back to hiking interest rates. So I think the, um, our view would be that the, the markets understandably are in a very, uh, very um, risk off mode. But ultimately, the Fed's going to go, end up having to fight inflation. And this is the reason why you're in the camp of another 25 basis point rate hike next week. But I do wonder longer term whether the signs of stress have kind of gut checked your sense of how much yeah. these long and variable lags have come to the fore and put a higher uh, or rather a lower cap on how high rates can go. Well, I think that unquestionably uh, this this uh, stress in the system now tightens financial conditions and is a warning about the lagged effects of monetary policy. It's actually been surprising how little impact the Fed's had up to now. Uh, they hiked at a very mm -hmm. fast pace. Now we're seeing some effects and, and perhaps an extreme effect. Um, and so it does have to make you a little more cautious about well, how far the Fed needs to go. Quickly, no I've question got to go to Mike, it. but you know, let's get out in front of Michael Gapin in the next hour with John Farrell. He's a good economist. I mean, he is. Good. I think it's so. Good. But let's get let's get the Harris Gapin view here. Did they hike too rapidly? Were you guys sitting over the last number of weeks going that the rate of change, the Newtonian calculus of all this dance, <laughs> is just a little bit off? No, I don't think so. You I weren't think, sitting there. Okay. I think that the. The original error was waiting too long to hike. Um, the gradualism of Greenspan, you know, the idea of hike early so you can hike slowly, wasn't uh, carried out. And it wasn't well, that's just what the, the shadow of Greenspan here. Is, the is, shadow is didn't that, do it. that they didn't do it, Greenspan. Okay. Said, what we've yeah. got to do is go to Michael McKee, who's diving into 47 pages of inflation data. Goods, you said, was 1%. Can you yep. be joyous about a service disinflation? <laughs> no, unfortunately, services go up a little bit, 7.26%. Uh, but a lot of that, as we mentioned, is housing. Owner's equivalent rent up 7 tenths, same as it was last month. Rent of primary residence up 8 tenths. That's a tenth more than it was in the month of January. But also, we got a big boost in the uh, lodging uh, category for shelter. It's up 2.3%. That's more than double what it was. Well, Lisa, in, are we shocked? Uh, the no, month of uh, January. <laughs> Airfares were up, but here's an interesting thing, and I'd be interested to see if, if uh, Ethan would go so far as to extrapolate the way I'm trying to here. But if you're looking at where you might be seeing wage increases, we've talked about leisure and hospitality a lot. Uh, food away from home, up six-tenths for the second month in a row. And uh, full-service meals, up six-tenths. Uh, that's a, a tenth higher than it was. So it, 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 prices are going up at restaurants. Uh, alcoholic beverage prices went down. I'm not sure if that's uh, – not went down, <laughs> but, the, but, uh, but tailed off in inflation. I'm not sure as Tom – 
help with that. But, but Mike, uh, to that point, and Ethan, I'd love you to weigh in on this, because we have seen people willing to spend, and they're willing to spend on services, and that isn't diminishing. Does stress in the financial system really change that if people can get their deposits and everyone just goes on their way? Well, if you can get past the panic moment here in the markets, which it is, um, you're back to an economy that's solid. It hasn't uh, threatened a recession yet. Um, as Mike pointed out, um, there's a lot of inflation in areas where labor costs are important. Uh, you can't fix your inflation problem just by getting an improvement in supply chains. You need to get uh, the service side under control. You need a normal labor market, and we don't have a normal labor market. Just quickly, I'd love your sense. Vincent Reinhart was on, and he yeah. said that if this Federal Reserve comes out and doesn't hike rates because of potential financial system stress, it is basically saying that what they did on Sunday was not effective, that that program mm -hmm. was not sufficient to stave off any distress. Do you agree? I mean, do you think that if they do not raise 25 basis points, that will be a policy error, given the data we've seen? I would never contradict Vince. We, he and I were grad students together. Um, anyway, so um, no, I think that the um, um, I, I think that it depends on how stressed the markets are. If the markets are in serious distress, pausing is okay. If they're improving mm -hmm. a lot and the ring fencing is working, then you can kind of start to wonder whether the Fed has confidence yeah. in its ring fencing. So I think that's yeah. a legitimate concern. You and Vincent Reinhardt were the laureate Ned Phelps. Yeah. His later career is dynamism. Do we risk losing our dynamism because of this crisis, and particularly the Silicon Valley crisis? Well, I think that the there's been a the, the COVID crisis itself has taken some of the mojo out of the economy. I think that the tech sector, uh, to some degree, is overexpanded. I think this is a temporary thing for tech. Tech is okay. still going to be a driver of growth going forward. Don't be a stranger. All right. bring, bring Mr. Moynihan with you next time. Dr. Mm -hmm. Harris is with the Bank of uh, America. Lisa, I, I, I don't know what to make of the inflation report. I mean, we've got some market reaction, but the, there the, it is. To me, what I make of it is the <clears throat> lack of market reaction. I thought that mm -hmm. if it came out even slightly higher, right. people would reassess, you know, a little bit on the margins, but not much. This is Bloomberg. Stay with us. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Emmanuel Macron faces parliamentary brinkmanship and protests this week over his plan to raise the retirement age. Wednesday, a group of 14 lawmakers from the National Assembly and Senate will meet behind closed doors to finalize a single bill to be presented for a vote in both houses. At the same time, unions will gather their forces for another day of strikes and protests against the proposed changes. The U.S. is urging Turkey to ratify the membership bids of Sweden and Finland into NATO as pressure builds on two remaining holdouts to approve the expansion of the military alliance. Officials from Turkey, Sweden and Finland have been trying to break an impasse that has held up NATO's expansion since the two Nordic countries were invited to join in June. Now, Turkey, the only holdout besides Hungary, wants Sweden to crack down on groups Ankara considers terrorists in exchange for agreeing to a session. President Biden plans to sign a new executive order intended to reduce gun violence. Biden will announce the move during a visit to the location of a mass shooting in Monterey Park, California. And the president is evoking the limited authority of the executive branch to edge the country closer to universal firearms, background checks, that something that he's been able, unable to get through Congress, even though it remains popular in voter surveys. And a victory for Uber, Lyft and other gig economy companies. A California appeals court has upheld the current law classifying gig workers as independent contractors instead of employees. The decision struck down a lower court ruling that found Proposition 22, the state measure that lets companies treat workers as independent contractors, violated California's constitution. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. If the meeting were today, the Fed would be absolutely tone deaf <laughs> to move rates higher. I don't think we should be questioning whether the tightening cycle is over yet. I think that's premature. But at least for the very near term, it would be hard to believe that a move higher in rates would be warranted right now.
Phil Camporiel, J.P. Morgan, thank you, Phil, for coming in today. There was uh, the weather got in the way of that. We really appreciate his effort to get into our studio. Off the inflation report, many reporting, including Catherine Judge. She's at CIBC Toronto, and she says housing inflation, a key driver. Lisa, you noticed that on the break. Seventy percent of the increase. It's uh, the single biggest contributor to the CPI gain. I'm also looking at what Mike was talking about, service aside inflation coming in hotter than expected. You saw an upside surprise in the core reading on a month-over-month -month basis, you are seeing in the Fed rates uh, market about a 5% <clears throat> Fed funds rate, terminal rate, being priced in now, which is marginally higher, but it's been whipsawed all over the place. Yeah. Next week, very difficult one for Fed Chair Jay Powell. Before we get to our good guests, uh, Credit Suisse, of course, and Zurich uh, taming down here in their afternoon uh, with a better, better uh, uh, appearance, price appearance, I should say, after their CEO spoke to our Francine Lacroix uh, in London. Look for that out on Bloomberg digital and the frc which i don't really know all that much about this troubled bank from 148 down to 31 i believe was the low and that's a, an Abramowitz bounce this morning. Yeah. I mean, 31 to 50 gets it done. Yeah, at one point it was uh, up 65 percent now, but up 58 uh, percent ahead of the market. You're seeing yeah. uh, similar, although lesser, moves in PacWest up almost 40 percent earlier this morning. A pre-market trade wow. again off a very <clears> low base, still incredibly depressed relative to where it was, but stability, revival, perhaps bottom fishers, whatever you want to call it. What people will do here is they'll look at the short-term market, the three-month market, and there are other things. There's alphabet soup, F-R-A-O-I-S-E-I-E-I-O. -E -E Old McDonald joins us now. Ira Jersey, our chief U.S. interest rate strategist for Bloomberg uh, Intelligence. Ira, thank you for uh, taking time out from writing your note this morning. What does the shortest of short-term paper, what does it say of our trust and confidence now? Uh, well, I, but trust and confidence, I think people still, you know, think that the U.S. is going to be money good. Um, that being said, you know, you look at some of those T-bills from August and, and they're pricing in for the uh, a small chance of a uh, default by the government due to the debt ceiling. But but even regardless of that, um, just taking, you know, the, the market moves the last couple of days, you can actually see how po how poor liquidity is, right? You don't get you don't get 50, 60 basis point moves, even with uh, the significant um, you know repricing of the Fed's terminal rate uh, without uh, without liquidity being really yeah. drained. I wrote, um, you know that's for sure. Before you keep going, I want to just pick up on that. That's exactly where I wanted to go with you. You say liquidity is so poor, and yet we saw a 300 percent increase in trading volumes yesterday <laughs> in Treasuries, a massive spike in volatility, as you say. What do you mean when you say that there is a lack of liquidity? Well, it, it's basically when you have uh, when you have regulate the regulatory environment like it is, it's just hard for uh, traditional intermediaries to increase the size of their balance sheet, whether they want to go long or short, and they're able to basically step in the middle of some of these large moves. And and keep in mind that that a lot of these moves, you know, certainly the 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 <clears throat> large rally we saw yesterday, a lot of that happened during European hours, right? The un, unsurprisingly, I guess, just given the news that came out over the weekend. Um, so so when you look at things like like bid offer spreads, naturally they're going to widen because of the amount of volatility. But more important is that you kind of have these po air pockets where where people just aren't willing to trade um, at every price necessarily, at least not in reasonably big size. And and because the, the Treasury market now is over $20 trillion and the size of some of the funding markets have basically remained the same over the last dozen years, um, it's it, you, you just have this mismatch of um, people able to lever up and, and take risk on a moment's notice than you did before. And 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 that, you know so so the that's kind of the downside of prudential regulation. So the good thing is is that you can have what happened over the weekend with SVB and and um, and Signature is depositors can be made whole because actually the regulations work the way they were intended. But on the other side, the the downside of that is that the markets themselves wind up being somewhat more volatile than they might be otherwise because you don't have the you know elasticity of balance sheets that you once had in, in the financial system. I want to build on this because there's a question about when something breaks and people are looking to Silicon Valley Bank. But I wonder when we could take a look at some of the volatility, the biggest moves that we've seen going back more than 40 years and say that's breaking too. That's 
positions being stopped out that's exerting maximal pain over all market participants and becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. At what point does that introduce an untenable risk for levered participants, for banks, for all sorts of entities that use these instruments, the deepest, most liquid market in the world, as a way to hedge all risk? Yeah, so so you know there are in in the rates market in my market there's a just a an absolute you know plethora of instruments in in the menu of of different ways to hedge right whether it's futures options on futures just outright options over the counter swaps right so there's just a whole bunch of instruments used to hedge the the, the thing is that there's some investors right and 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 some institutions that either aren't willing to pay for those hedges mm -hmm. maybe don't understand those hedges and don't under necessarily understand and the risk that they have to take now now some of some of what's going on i think at the moment is is you know yeah the rate some of the regulations worked as intended but the unintended consequences of that are things like you know holding a lot of mortgage backed securities that are unhedged on your portfolio that are very underwater right that that you know aren't yeah. trading near par they're trading at 80 cents on the dollar right some of them Our so so, so and, and they have to hold those in order to meet some of the regulatory requirements. So 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 that means that you have to be better at risk management than a lot of smaller mm -hmm. institutions are able to be. Ira, I want you to talk about the emotion of rates going up and all of a sudden, and Lisa, you could tell me to the minute you're so good at this, looking at BTMM, where a money market fund is a proxy, became 5.00%. And everybody at 4.99% was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, boom, <laughs> let's go. Did that shift of emotion to a new big handle change things, 5.00%? Did that shift the markets? Well, I, I think not to not to five percent generally, but now you have an alternative to you know to, to other lower yielding assets or assets with a lot of volatility, right? So, you know, I I've spoken to a lot of investors, you know, multi asset investors who can kind of go anywhere, right? Whether it's equities or FX or or, or rates, and they're like, well, you know, I'm buying one year bills now because at five percent. Why not? Right. Like that's it's not quite an equity like return that we expect. But given the volatility mm -hmm. of a lot of different markets, that doesn't seem, you know, seems like a, a reasonable place to park some money for a little while. Um, so, yeah, th there's definitely right. the fact that you have an inverted curve and um, and these yields that are you know not historically high, but high versus the last 15 years um, just seems attractive to a lot of investors. And, and you are seeing some money flow that way for sure. Ira Jersey, thank you so much with Bloomberg Intelligence. Look for his work out on uh, the Bloomberg Terminal with his team as well. Lisa, up a stick on the Dow. NASDAQ up a stick as well. VIX comes in two big points, 24.45. The VIX comes in six big points from the sweat of a few days ago. I guess we avoided a massive upside <clears throat> surprise, which would have really uh, perhaps given an aneurysm to some people on the central bank who would have to deal with that, as well as financial stability risk. The move index, the uh, volatility utility gauge What's for bonds like? still very high, uh, still surging and uh, at the highest levels that we've seen going back to 2009. Of course, it doesn't reset necessarily <clears throat> at, at real time. Just to go to what Ira Jersey was talking about. Have we just experienced essentially a flash crash, a mini flash crash in the Treasury market in uh, the wake of poor liquidity, less intermediation, disintermediation by big banks, and a complete lack of conviction of where things are? What does that do longer term if you get these bouts of volatility in benchmark rates? And I'm talking about six-month yields, for example, which hit 4.6% uh, yesterday and are back up nearly to 5% today, 4.92%. Massive swings that you just see in these benchmark well, in, uh, instruments. To the comments of the president, the first order condition is to maintain trust and confidence in the banking system. And I thought that, among others, the banker French Hill of Arkansas laid out today clearly how unique the San Francisco, the Silicon Valley, the Santa Clara, whatever it is, experience uh, was. And we seem to be getting beyond that. Maybe the most important headline today was knowing that Fortress Schwar uh, Schwartzman is looking at whatever the debris is on their balance sheet. That was maybe the single most important headline today, whether it's true or not that Blackstone's coming in. Well, Blackstone, Apollo, among those rumored <clears throat> to are uh, reported to uh, have bid on some of these assets. Have we cleared the air? Have we avoided mm something more significant. The days will bore out, but it seems there is a moment of calm in a market that's reassessing the data. It's like Huntley Brinkley, folks. It's Horton Matthew. Balance of power tonight. 
with the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, an important conversation, balance of power from Washington. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg 